All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome, everyone joining in person and also those of you joining virtually to our first committee member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine study on community wastewater based infectious disease surveillance. My name is Guy Palmer. I'm the chair of the committee. I'm a professor at Washington State University, where I serve as uh, director, senior director of global health for the university. Our community has our, our committee has been tasked to review community level wastewater disease surveillance and its potential value towards prevention um, and control of infectious diseases in the United States. If I can advance this slide. Um, next slide. Yep. Uh, the statement of task is, is presented here, and that is available on the website for the committee uh, for those of you who want to review this in depth. Uh, but an ad hoc committee, and I'll um, introduce the committee members uh, here in just a moment, um, will review this community level wastewater um, based surveillance um, based on the statement of task. Um, you can see that here. Basically, it's to describe what wastewater based surveillance, uh, disease surveillance is, and how it uh, is different from other approaches to disease surveillance. We'll review how wastewater-based surveillance has been useful um, in COVID-19 during the pandemic and how that has informed uh, public health decisions. We'll also examine the potential value of wastewater-based disease surveillance for understanding and preventive, uh, preventing disease and illness beyond COVID um, and the strengths and limitations of this approach uh, in the United States. We'll describe the general characteristics of an approach for a national system uh, for wastewater-based disease surveillance and discuss broad approaches to um, increase the public health impact, basically um, how this will inform decision-making. Um, for the purposes of this study, it's important to emphasize that community level uh, wastewater-based surveillance does not include local surveillance at a neighborhood or institutional level. Next slide, please. Um, th th and this is what will um, be uh, the current focus, which is the phase one part of our study. Uh, phase two um, is uh, defined here um, and is, is present on the committee. I think for today, we're going to focus really on our on our phase one of our of our study um, proposal. But this is available on the committee website, phase two. Obviously, this is linked um, as we progress through, through the different phases. Next slide, please. So the study schedule for phase one, um, we've had, um, this is the first uh, hybrid committee meeting. Um, we'll have a second hybrid committee meeting in June um, with a goal of compiling this report um, in October. Um, with a public report release uh, in November, and then progress to, to phase two, which is tentative um, at this time. Next slide, please. Okay, the committee roster. Um, I, I'm going to actually ask the committee members um, to introduce themselves, um, starting with Ami. And if you just say um, basically what your er area of expertise is and, and the institution you're located at. Thank you. My name is Ami Hutt. I'm an associate professor of medicine and genetics at Stanford University. And my area of expertise is the human gut microbiome and measuring viruses and bacteria in human stool. Thank you. Marissa? Uh, Marissa is not here. Uh, Raul. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm an environmental scientist at Hampton Rose Sanitation District. And my, my background is in molecular quantification of, of markers in surface waters. Chuck. Chuck Haas, Drexel University, professor of environmental engineering. And my expertise is microbial risk assessment and fate and transport of pathogens in the water environment. Lauren. Good morning, I'm Lauren Hopkins. I'm a Chief Environmental Science Officer for the City of Houston, and I run our um, Moist Water Surveillance Program and Public Health Intervention for the city. Nataki. Nataki Osborne-Jelks, Assistant Professor of Environmental and Health Sciences at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Um, my work is at the intersection of water resources management and public health. Christine. Good morning, I'm Christine Quitter Johnson. I'm an epidemiologist at the University of California, Davis, and my expertise is in infectious disease and surveillance. Rob. Hi, I'm uh, Rob Knight. I direct the Center for Microbiome Innovation at UC San Diego, where I'm a professor of pediatrics, bioengineering, and computer science and engineering. And uh, my expertise is in uh, microbiome technology and data analysis. Sandra. Good morning. I'm a professor in the School of Freshwater Sciences, and my expertise is in environmental microbiology and bacterial genetics. And our lab develops new indicators to track pollution sources in the environment, especially untreated sewage. Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Mello. I'm a professor of law and health policy at Stanford, and my work focuses on issues of public health ethics and public health law. Scott. I'm Scott Meschke. I'm a professor and associate chair in environmental and occupational health sciences in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington. And I focus on fake transport detection and control of pathogens in the environment. Rebecca. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rekha Singh, and I am serving as Wastewater Surveillance Program Manager at Virginia Department of Health. And my expertise is uh, environmental science, engineering, and public health. Naraj. Good morning, everyone. I'm a professor at the University of Southern California, and my expertise is in health policy and economics. And Krista. Hello, I'm Krista Wigginton. I'm an associate professor at the University of Michigan in civil and environmental engineering. Uh, my research focus is on uh, the mechanistic fate of viruses in the, in the environment and their detection. And we have one other member of the committee who is, who's not here this morning. I think she's gonna be joining in the afternoon and that's Marissa Eisenberg of uh, the University of Michigan. Um, before we kick off this first session, I do wanna note that this is an open on the record session. Um, this is being live streamed and will be archived um, for, for later viewing after the event. After the, the event, This meeting is being held to gather information to help the committee conduct its study. The committee will examine the information material obtained during this and other public meetings in order to inform its work. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. Um, committee members will often ask uh, probing questions in these information, information gathering sessions um, that may not be indicative of their personal views or the, or the views of the committee. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before, find it, before writing its uh, draft report. Um, moreover, once the report is actually drafted and written by the committee, it undergoes rigorous um, independent review by experts who are anonymous to the committee, and the committee must respond to this review uh, with appropriate revisions to um, satisfy the Academy's report review committee. And only once the NAS president um, has signed off is this considered an official Academy's report and the recommendations um, held within. Um, therefore, observers should not uh, draw conclusions about the committee's work based on today's discussions. Uh, doing so would be premature. Um, next slide. This is the agenda um, we're going to start with. Uh, I think we're just a couple minutes behind schedule. Um, so let's go ahead and, and progress um, with that. We're going to have an overview of the National Wastewater Surveillance System uh, by speakers from the CDC. And our first um, speaker is Amy Kirby, who will give us an overview of this system. And she is a microbiologist and senior service fellow at the, at the CDC. Amy. Thank you. Uh, uh oh. Is not mine. All right. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Amy Kirby. I'm the program lead for the National Wastewater Surveillance System. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time uh, to be here today and talk about wastewater surveillance. Um, as uh, Guy said, we will start with an overview this morning of the National Wastewater Surveillance System and how it is structured. Uh, in my initial introduction, I'm really going to focus on the implementation of the system and 
uh, the decisions we had to make uh, to get this system up and running quickly in the context uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then uh, we'll dive into more of the science of the, the laboratory testing and the data analytics uh, with other talks uh, later today. Okay, so I always start with this slide. Um, this is the four um, major advantages of wastewater surveillance, specifically for SARS-CoV-2, although many of these uh, advantages will apply to other uh, health uh, targets as well. Um, the first, and we recognize this very early on, is that uh, about 50% uh, of individuals that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 will shed detectable viral RNA in their feces. And this shedding happens whether uh, they have symptoms or not. It happens in adults and children, and it happens very, very early in the infection. And so what that means is that by looking at uh, wastewater as sort of a pooled community stool sample, we can get uh, data on the full spectrum of diseases that are in a community, which is very different from our clinical surveillance, which is um, primarily going to detect symptomatic and severe infections. Second, and what I think is really the most powerful benefit of wastewater surveillance is that it's independent of healthcare seeking behavior and testing access. So it doesn't matter if people go to the doctor, it doesn't matter if they get tested, it doesn't matter if that test is reported to uh, health departments as we see uh, now changing with a movement towards home testing. As long as uh, that community is using toilets that are connected to a sewer system, we can get information on the overall uh, infection levels in that community through wastewater surveillance. Third, it's a very efficient method of getting community level data. So with that single sample collected at a wastewater treatment plant, uh, we can get information on hundreds, thousands, even millions of people in our very largest systems uh, here in the US. And finally, it's fast. Um, from the time the toilet is flushed until we have data in hand is about five to seven days. And throughout the course of the pandemic, we've seen that this is a leading indicator of trends in the community. So we detect uh, trends in wastewater on average four to six days before we see those same trends reflected uh, in case data and about 10 days before we see uh, those trends reflected in hospitalization data. So as I said, I really want to focus uh, my talk this morning on the structure and how we implemented this system. So this is an overview of the data flow for news. So if you start at the top left, of course, we have communities as our source of wastewater. That wastewater flows uh, to wastewater treatment plants where the sample is collected. The sample then goes to laboratories for testing. Uh, that data is sent to a health department and that then they submit the data uh, to CDC for analysis and we report it back um, both to the health departments and to the public um, for use. But let's look through um, each of those stakeholders um, because each of them have uh, some impacts on how this system was ultimately set up. So let's start uh, with CDC. And I think it's worth taking a step back and thinking about what CDC's role is in national disease surveillance. Um, and really it comes down to these four uh, functions. Uh, first and foremost, CDC's role is to ensure data comparability across jurisdictions and over time. Um, for wastewater surveillance, that is particularly critical because we did not and still do not have standard methods for wastewater testing for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so it was, uh, this is sort of a, a factor, um, a, a complication of environmental microbiology, right? We don't have um, diagnostics the way they have for clinical testing. And so we had to uh, evaluate these methods as they were being developed, but we wanted to put them to use as soon as there was evidence that they uh, could be useful. And so we just chose to take the approach of um, letting, uh, as uh, my colleague Rory Welsh says, you'll hear from him later today, we chose the method of letting a thousand methods bloom um, and seeing which ones are performing well over time and uh, protecting that flexibility to be able to change methods um, as the pandemic evolved. And so really um, one of our key focuses then is to make sure that even though the data is being collected, we're using different methods, ultimately the metrics that we're looking at across jurisdictions are as comparable as they can be. Um, second, uh, we of course analyze data, but really we provide public health interpretation and guidance. And that goes with that third bullet, which is providing technical assistance to implementers. Uh, 
Um, how do you design a sampling frame? What is the best way to sample and test? How do we evaluate and use this data once we have it um, back in our hands for our communities? Um, and finally, CDC does a lot of um, summary, uh, national level summaries of data um, and making that data available for states, uh, the public, um, as well as other stakeholder organizations. I think it's worth taking just a minute to look at what a <laughs> typical surveillance system looks like and the timeline for establishing it, um, because timeline played a big role in how news was stood up. Um, and so I always think about um, news in comparison to PulseNet, um, which is a system that was established um, just over 25 years ago to uh, address uh, foodborne outbreaks. So in 1993, there was the large Jack in the Box E. coli 0157H7 outbreak. And that was really the inciting outbreak for the development of PulseNet. So that's 1993. A year later, there was validation of the method they were going to use, which is um, pulse field gel electrophoresis, or PFGE. And then a year after that, uh, CDC and APHL developed the concept for PulseNet as a surveillance system. And then a year after that, um, PulseNet was launched in four pilot states. So we're already three years after this inciting outbreak. And keep in mind, we knew about E. coli 0157H7 even prior to 1993. Um, so this is a more typical uh, um, time frame for establishment of a new surveillance system. So four states in 1996. In 1997, we have the establishment of a funding mechanism um, for our public health uh, jurisdictions, which is the Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Cooperative Agreement, which we still uh, rely heavily on today. And then in 2000, they um, added more software to enable uh, um, analysis at scale. And then by 2001, five years later, they had scaled PulseNet to all 50 states. Um, and then worth noting that in 2015, they began shifting away from PFG to an improved um, analysis method, which is whole genome sequencing. And that transition um, took three years to get all 50 states switched over. So that's a 25 year time frame. What has news looked like? Um, I want to first draw your attention to the fact that our arrow is now only six years. Um, represented there. So our pathogen that we're targeting, SARS-CoV-2, first emerged in late 2019. Um, in January of 2020, of course, we had the first U.S. case. And then over the course of that year, we evaluated the uh, concept of wastewater surveillance, gathered data on how well it was performing, how well it correlated with trends in cases, um, and developed the system that I'm going to tell you about. And in September of 2020, we were able to launch uh, news in eight uh, states. Now, uh, about a year later, uh, uh, in August of 2021, um, we had our first major funding round um, through, again, that Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Cooperative Agreement. And in that round, um, we have 43 jurisdictions funded. Um, so a major expansion just in the first year. Um, as of this month, um, we have 841 utilities that are reporting data through their state to CDC, um, and that's in 44 uh, states. For uh, the future, so over the next three years, we're going to continue developing the system. So adding new methods, uh, variant tracking through sequencing, we're going to be transitioning to digital PCR, so converging on a single method as opposed to the uh, letting all methods bloom approach. We're going to be adding non-COVID targets, which you'll hear more about uh, this afternoon from Rory Welsh. Um, and our goal is to expand to all 50 states um, and also to territories and tribal nations. So very quickly, um, only six years from the pathogen first being identified um, to full 50 state implementation and uh, sort of the full vision of what news can be. Um, so we're under a very quick timeline and that has had some implications on how the system is set up. So that's what happened at CDC. Um, working backwards through our data flow, state and uh, local health departments um, are our primary uh, point of contact with these systems. So every state is going to implement their own wastewater surveillance network. Um, and that's primarily because CDC has that ELC mechanism available to directly fund our state and local uh, health departments uh, to support these public health activities. 
And so we have been uh, initially funding them through COVID supplements, um, but now we are part of the annual ELC funding cycle. So every year um, there's going to be an opportunity for state, local, and uh, territorial health departments to apply for funding from CDC to support wastewater surveillance. And we've been quite broad with how that funding can be used. Um, so obviously surveillance coordination is going to be the top of the list, um, but they can also use that funding to support sample collection and shipping, laboratory testing, um, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute, IT resources to manage all of this data and make sure that it gets to CDC. Many of them have used uh, these IT resources to build their own um, internal or public facing dashboards for wastewater data. Um, and they can also use it for contract support. So if they want to contract out the laboratory testing, if they're able to support their utilities um, through contracts to utilities, they are able to do that. So we really want this uh, funding to be as flexible as it can be to support the state needs. That state-led implementation um, leads to a lot more variability when we get to the laboratory and wastewater treatment plants that are enrolled. Um, so if we focus on the laboratories first, um, we see a real diversity in the way states have chosen to implement this. Um, so some of them are able to do this testing in their uh, public health laboratories and environmental health laboratories. And so that um, is a more traditional approach to disease surveillance to have it be essentially in-house to your health departments. Um, others uh, have chosen to partner with academic uh, researchers that are able to do this type of testing. That's really where the majority of the expertise uh, for this type of testing lay in 2020. Um, and so they have been able to um, rapidly build up this capacity to do uh, real-time testing and provide that data to health department partners. Um, and then uh, there are some uh, utilities that are able to do this testing themselves. So in some cases, the utility is also the testing lab. And then finally, there's been uh, a real boom in the amount of private laboratories that are offering this type of testing. So some of our uh, states have partnered with private labs uh, to get this testing done. Uh, and I'll talk more about a testing contract that CDC has uh, put in place as well. And then that state-led uh, um, variability and decision-making also has uh, impacts on the wastewater treatment plants that are involved. Um, we have uh, let states make their own decisions about how they are going to enroll wastewater utilities into their system. Um, some of them have opted to do full coverage, so every wastewater plant in the state is enrolled. Um, others have targeted high-risk uh, utilities, so thinking about large cities, transportation hubs, um, particularly vulnerable communities. Um, and frankly, others um, have only done a few pilot implementations because remember, they are building a new system while they are also dealing with a pandemic. So our health departments were very stretched and many of them were very clear that bandwidth was a limitation on how um, extensively they could implement news. Um, and so we have quite a bit of variability in the uh, scale of coverage uh, that our states have implemented in the past year. Despite all of those barriers, um, we have had great growth uh, in the new system over the past uh, year and a half. So this graphic, uh, Zach made it yesterday for us. So this is showing uh, enrollment of sampling sites over the past year and a half. The dots are scaled by the population uh, that each of those sampling sites represents. And this is both our state-led systems, which is our core news um, testing capacity, but we have also chosen to supplement those state systems with a nationwide commercial testing contract. So this is working with um, those uh, private industries that are able to offer this testing. Um, we have a contract uh, that will provide testing twice a week to an additional 500 sites. Um, this is not going to be a permanent component of news. This is a uh, way for us to rapidly scale up coverage as our states uh, develop their own system. Um, together, uh, we have 741 sites that are reporting data into news. Again, that's 44 states uh, with data, uh, the District of Columbia, and eight tribes uh, that have data in the system. And collectively, the population covered um, by all of those sites is over 109 million people. So we're already at over 30% of the U.S. population. Now, uh, there are, of course, challenges. Um, there is a hard limit to how much uh, 
wastewater surveillance can grow. Um, and that's really based on uh, wastewater system coverage. So estimates range from uh, 20 to 25 percent of U.S. residents are not connected to sewer systems. Um, and so they will not be accessible. Those communities and households will not be accessible by wastewater surveillance. Um, I also like to note that while that um, lack of sewer coverage is primarily rural, it is not exclusively rural. You can find pockets um, of septic systems um, even within large cities. So it's always important um, to know what your septic system coverage is uh, in any community that you're performing wastewater surveillance in. Also in the past 15 years or so, there has been a real movement uh, for large facilities to do their own on-site wastewater treatment. Um, and so not making use of these municipal systems. Importantly for wastewater surveillance, that trend is particularly pronounced with universities and correctional facilities. Um, and so many times if you're doing wastewater surveillance in a community and there's uh, a large university, it may not be contributing um, to the community sample because they're doing their own on-site treatment. Um, so very important to work closely with utility partners to know what exactly is part uh, of the wastewater coming into a treatment plant. Um, we'll hear more about these other uh, barriers uh, going uh, in the next few, talk, few uh, presentations, um, but I do wanna note that it is not easy um, to communicate about wastewater data. Um, it requires careful um, uh, analysis and communication, uh, and it can be a real challenge for plain language communication to the public. Um, and one of the core uh, messages that we uh, really get concerned about people misinterpreting is if, uh, for example, SARS-CoV-2 is not detected in your community wastewater, that does not mean that your community is free of cases. It just means it's below the limit of detection for this surveillance method. Um, so we need to be really careful when we start getting into low incidence periods where uh, we're getting negative results, that that doesn't mean um, that we're free of COVID. Um, we also have some barriers to sustainability of the program. Um, there was hesitance to implement what people saw as a pilot program. Um, I'm hearing less of that uh, recently. So I think there, uh, I know that with the agency, there is a dedication to this being part of our surveillance portfolio. And I think that uh, message is getting out um, to the implementer community. Um, but we also want to try and formalize some of that structure, especially around the laboratory testing. Um, and move the laboratory testing as much as we can into public health laboratories. Those are the labs that are built for sustainable surveillance testing. Um, and we need to be able to free up particularly our academic partners uh, to do the research that's needed to move this forward. And we have seen um, wastewater data be used uh, for many different things uh, in our um, communities. What we hear most commonly from our implementers is that they value wastewater surveillance because it helps them distinguish the signal from the noise and all of the surveillance data that's coming in. And that's really because it is independent of healthcare seeking behavior and clinical testing. Um, so almost all of our other surveillance indicators are linked to clinical care. They get skewed by many of the same uh, drivers but wastewater surveillance, because it's independent, does not. And so it gives them that check of, you know, cases are doing something funny. What do we see with wastewater surveillance? Is it going up or is it going down or is it stable? And then they're using that information to make decisions about resource allocation. Where are we going to send additional mobile testing units? Um, where are we going to send additional, which hospitals need additional support because they're going to be seeing cases uh, on their door in the next week or two? Um, and wastewater surveillance is really great for that near-term forecasting of what's going to happen in the next week or two, because again, it's that first signal uh, of cases in the community. And we've also increasingly seen wastewater used as a way to monitor the impact of interventions. Um, the first use of this was a study that was uh, joint between NIH and CDC looking at the impact of home testing. So this was back in uh, mid-2021. Um, and they used uh, wastewater surveillance as a community level indicator of the impact of this community level intervention. Um, and I've linked you there to our MMWR, which gives more details about how states are using uh, this type of data to inform their response. So that brings us now to a really critical transition point uh, for wastewater surveillance. 
Um, we have seen that uh, surveillance overall for SARS-CoV-2 is changing um, with less of a focus on uh, massive screening tests and more of a focus on uh, the type of indicators that would be associated with severe disease. Um, but wastewater surveillance is still very important for providing that situational awareness. So this is a good time to really dive into what is the role for wastewater surveillance um, for SARS-CoV-2, but also for these other pathogens um, that we want to expand to. And importantly, how can we leverage this infrastructure that we have built for wastewater surveillance to get the samples collected by the utilities, to get them shipped to laboratories, to move all of this data from laboratories to health departments, to CDC, and back again and out to the public how can we leverage that to provide the best possible data for public health action, not just now, but also in the future, 5, 10, 20 years from now? Um, and so I'm really uh, very excited to see uh, what the committee uh, comes up with and what your thoughts are um, on the, the, the potential applications of wastewater surveillance in the future. Um, and with that, um, I would be happy to answer questions if we have time. I can't remember what the timing is here. Yeah, thank you, Amy. No, we're, we have about 10 minutes for, um, for questions from the committee. Um, I think the... Chuck has his hand raised. Okay. I can't see that. Oh, there's... Yeah, Chuck? Hi, Amy. Um, two questions for you. Um, first of all, looking at your state map, looks like there's seven states that have not opted in. And so, you know your insight into why that has occurred. And then my other question, um, tackle both at once, is how about situations which, they're certainly not uncommon, I don't have a sense of what the proportion is, where the geographic coverage maps of the local health agencies are different than the geographic coverage maps of the utilities and thoughts on reconciling that. Okay, um, so the first question about the states that have not opted in, um, for many of them, it's a bandwidth issue. So they, these were the states that were particularly concerned that this is a pilot system and that we're only okay. doing it for COVID and then it's gonna be stood down and it's gonna be abandoned and standing up this whole new system just to have it be shut back down um, was more than they could accommodate uh, in the midst of the pandemic, which is absolutely fair um, from a resource uh, standpoint. Um, I am hopeful that now in this next round of funding, we will be able to get some of those states on board um, because we have worked very hard to make it clear that this is not a pilot. Um, this is a longstanding uh, surveillance system. Um, that said, I, I would be, um, remiss if I didn't also uh, say that there are political decisions in here. So some states are not interested um, in really uh, engaging with the COVID response. And of course, wastewater surveillance is tightly linked to that. Um, so I'm sure there's some of that um, in some of these states as well. Um, as far as the geographic coverage, I, I guess I, I need a little more information on what exactly you are seeing different. Well, is it... So, I mean, the utilities often service geographic areas that are different than the local health departments. And, you know, so what happens in a case like that? I mean, the one that quickly comes to mind based on my experience is Chicago, you yeah. know, where Chicago is not coterminous with the city. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that sort of geographic uh, boundary issue is huge for wave, all aspects of wastewater surveillance, right? because a wastewater system's boundaries often don't align with any other jurisdictional boundary. It doesn't align with a county, a city, a health department, any of those things. Um, it's something that we always have in mind um, and primarily why most of our work is through state health departments um, because there you have less of those issues. There are a few uh, wastewater systems that cross state boundaries, but they're, um, the exception, not the rule. Um, however, we do have some very large um, local health departments that run their own uh, health, uh, wastewater systems. Um, Chicago is a great example. Houston is another one. LA is another one. Um, and those systems uh, tend to be, uh, they have very close coordination with their utilities to understand where their boundaries are. 
Um, we have also provided a uh, R code that will allow them to use the geographic data within their case data and align it with their uh, system boundaries from the utility so that they're comparing only cases that live within the geographic area of those sewer sheds. So we, we refer to that as sewer shed level case data um, and Zach can speak more to that. Um, so we're trying to build as many tools as we can um, to address that. We can also visualize those boundaries in our internal uh, dashboard, which Zach will show you more about. Um, so trying to really uh, make sure everyone recognizes that those boundaries aren't the same um, and we need to account for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got three questions. It'll be Michelle, then Neeraj, then, then Rekha. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I'm really struck by the speed with which the system was stood up. And I wonder if you could just talk about some of the trade-offs that you had to make in order to make that happen, um, or maybe putting it a different way. Is there anything that you would have done differently if speed had not been such a factor? Yeah, the biggest one is the method. Um, if we had had the time, it would have been uh, easier, I think, in the long run to do a full method evaluation from the beginning, um, identify an ideal single sampling processing testing method uh, for news so that everybody was using the same approach. Um, but we didn't want to slow down the implementation waiting for that. And we also didn't feel like we had enough data suggesting that a single method was outperforming the others to force everyone to one from the beginning. Um, and then, in total you know, transparency, we now see that there are a handful of methods that are working very well, but we know we're moving towards this multi-pathogen platform. So we don't wanna ask uh, states to switch to a single COVID test uh, to then you know, a year later come back and say, and now there's this new one that's a multi-pathogen. So um, SARS-CoV-2 surveillance seems to be working well, um, allowing those multiple methods to be used, um, but we are going to converge on that single method uh, as we expand targets. Neeraj. So Amy, thank you for your, uh, for your presentation. I had a couple of questions. So the first one was, what is the time lag from sample collection from a wastewater plant to actually kind of getting a actionable report. So what does, you know, well, how much time does it take to, to, to do that? Because I guess that would influence how actionable uh, the data is. And uh, the second question I had was, you mentioned that one of the limitations was uh, that, you know, there might be low sensitivity, which is, there is COVID in the community or some disease in the community and uh, the test result would be negative. So I, I just wanna know what the sensitivity is if there is a range that's available. Yeah, so the time lag um, can be very short. So it can be as short as two to three days if there is um, frankly money put into making everything go as quickly as possible, right? So shipping um, with, you know, first, uh, first arrival, whatever they call it, the one where they deliver by 10 o'clock in the morning, um, and then a real emphasis on 24-hour turnaround in the lab um, and getting data from the health department to CDC um, as soon as it arrives in their laboratory. That can be very quick. Um, however, um, we know there's delays at every step. What we see in our system is that from sample collection until we get data in the CDC system, uh, is about six days right now, um, but there is a long tail on that. Um, and so what we are doing now is trying to identify where the barriers are to timely data transfer and submission um, and eliminate those and make them as small as we possibly can. For example, facilitating data submission through something like an API. Um, as far as the sensitivity, uh, we don't have an estimate for the national system overall as far as sensitivity. Um, what I can tell you is our epidemiology team here as part of the COVID response has done uh, a uh, sensitivity analysis of sentinel surveillance systems in low incidence periods. And they compared wastewater surveillance to overall case surveillance, school-based surveillance and nursing home-based surveillance. And what they found is that regardless of how they did this analysis, 
um, wastewater surveillance was always the most sensitive approach and was the first to flag um, in those low incidence periods. So um, we think the, the sensitivity is very, very low, um, but we're still working to get good numbers for that. Okay, our, our last question um, is going to come from Rekha, but Scott and Krista, write your questions down because we'll we will get we will get to them one way or the other because um, they're important. Can go I ahead. go now? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy, for a great presentation, uh, and uh, you covered pretty much some part of my question. Um, as you said, like different states are. Um, exploring um, implementing this program a little differently uh, with limited resources. So a national guidance document uh, on not only collecting data, but also on educating public would be very helpful. And uh, I'm not sure like what are our plans to uh, come up with that? Do we have any, uh, any plans on that? Creating a national guidance document? So we do have resources that are available to our health department partners. Um, we have not, uh, we don't have plans right now for a overall national guidance document, but I think that's a really great, um, a great suggestion. The challenge there is identifying who your audience is, because if your audience is utilities, it's very different than health departments, which is very different from the public. Um, and so we've been trying to provide resources as a, uh, as they're needed, so resources for the public as we roll out things like COVID data tracker um, so that they can understand uh, how this data can be used uh, to help them make decisions on an everyday basis. Um, but yes, there is always um, a need for uh, more resources and, and technical support. Thank you. All right, um, thank you, Amy. Uh, that was a great overview to, to get us started. Really, really appreciate it. Um, Next, we're going to hear from, from Rachel West about building and engaging trust uh, for the wastewater system, National Wastewater Surveillance System. Uh, she is a health scientist and presidential management fellow at the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch at CDC. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Or at least I can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, hopefully everyone else can hear me as well. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me today to present to you on building community trust and engagement. Um, I am the acting program support and coordination lead for news. And today I wanted to expand a bit on Amy's discussion of implementation, more on uh, the utilities and community trust side, as well as some considerations of ethics surrounding wastewater surveillance. So let's see if the slide will advance. There we go, okay. Um, so as Amy described, um, this is our uh, framework for the National Wastewater Surveillance System. And in my talk, I'll be focusing on uh, what is in this green circle, um, our communities and the wastewater treatment plants, and really how they interact with our state, tribal, local, and territorial health departments. So as many of you know, wastewater surveillance really requires um, significant uh, public health collaboration with environmental health. And this uh, primarily depends on the wastewater surveillance um, timeliness, and that depends upon our utility sampling. So there's this cycle and, um, and building of relationships between the health department expertise, utility outreach, as well as community engagement. And we found throughout the pandemic and throughout the history of news that utilities are, of course, a key partner uh, that we have not traditionally engaged quite as much in public health. But coordinating with them uh, throughout building a wastewater surveillance program really helps ensure its success and its applicability. Uh, and effectively connecting these public health partners with environmental health partners early on uh, really helps to ensure that that communication and coordination is there from uh, an early point. So what really goes into wastewater sampling at a utility? Uh, as Amy mentioned, 
Uh, it requires quite a bit of input and time. And so far, this has been completely voluntary on utilities parts. And so this system certainly uh, rests on their shoulders. Uh, the samples that they provide um, gives us more data and that provides better, more reliable trends that we can then communicate to our communities. Uh, but to get timely data, sampling protocols um, are best to have consistent. And also if you can design that with a utility partner, that is really optimal. And we would typically recommend sampling twice a week, uh, once a week if that's not possible. And these samples can be a variety of types of samples. So it can be a grab sample, it can be a composite sample. It sort of depends on the uh, tools that are available to that uh, treatment plant or that sampling site. But this also uh, brings into play staffing needs. So while everyone uh, has experienced uh, some prob probable stress through the pandemic, our wastewater utility partners, of course, have been continuing to serve throughout uh, the pandemic in their own capacities. And on top of their daily duties, um, having to sample for wastewater for COVID-19 surveillance, uh, it can take significant time, especially if that sampling is beyond the scope or uh, frequency of what they normally do. And so respecting that um, is really important as well in understanding their capacity and their bandwidth. Um, in addition, the shipping and storage of samples, making sure that they have adequate shipping supplies, they know exactly where the samples should be going, that can really better ensure that timely data that we need. And as I mentioned, so far, utilities are primarily participating voluntarily. Some states and some jurisdictions are able to provide compensation, but this is not, uh, this is not standard across the board. And um, so this is something that should also be considered considered when trying to implement a wastewater surveillance system and getting their uh, buy-in is understanding truly how much this will add to their plate. And some states and jurisdictions are better poised than others to provide things like um, stipends or uh, financial support for sampling. And we have heard that that aids in utility retention. So as I mentioned, promoting these partnerships early on is really key to program successes. And several of our implementing partners have actually uh, taught us at NEWS quite a bit about how to best engage with utilities, challenges they've faced. But we do recommend that if you are building a wastewater surveillance system, or even if you're in the midst of building it, connect with your utility partners as soon as you can. Uh, they have great insight into the infrastructure of systems. They also know their community very well. And making sure to establish that relationship early on, not only uh, for coordination purposes, but also for trust purposes um, and for sharing data that can really benefit um, that relationship and, and strengthen that for the future to ensure that you retain those utilities and you're able to sample um, regularly and in a timely way. And so this would include early consulting of the utility capacity, uh, really better trying to understand uh, what they can really handle. Is that twice weekly sampling? Is that once weekly? Is it once per month? Um, how long will it take them to find a shipping location to ship these samples for our more remote utilities? That can be a significant amount of time. Uh, and so utility input in designing that sampling plan can really be helpful, not only for the health department to understand what kinds of samples uh, are available, but to better establish what the sampling time is, what the frequency is, so that everyone is on the same page about expectations. And then regularly communicating that data to the utilities. Uh, some of our implementing partners have been really wonderful about doing this, uh, but although public health um, action primarily resides with the health department partners, uh, utilities are providing these samples and they really value seeing the data. Not all utilities may be interested, but it's important to uh, recognize those that would like to see the data uh, and better understand what's going on in their community and how they're contributing to that. Um, they're also very interested in how the data are being used, uh, which I'll get into a bit more when we talk about ethics of wastewater surveillance, having that clear purpose of data use. And then continuing to have consistent meetings uh, really helps with utility retention. So better understanding challenges as they arise, 
um, if there's a temporary challenge that may disrupt sampling or if there's something major coming up, if there's a staffing shortage or if someone is moving on from their position, better coordinating that so that all of the correct points of contact know who the other one is. Um, that is also really important in maintaining high quality data. So at NEWS, we're really working to better support utilities, and this is through some of our partnerships with other federal agencies, as well as partners like the Water Environment Federation, who have a great rapport with utilities and really understand their needs. Uh, one thing that we are also focusing on that Water Environment Federation uh, has some valuable connections with is with more rural or remote utilities that have different challenges than our urban utilities better understanding uh, what those might be and how we can support them. We're also trying to explore methods uh, and ways to financially support utilities. Uh, right now, our ELC funding, our, our states and our jurisdictions are able to use that funding in some cases to support utilities, uh, but, this, but we still wanna find other ways to do this so that we're showing utilities how important they are to this effort, and trying to support them as best as we can. And further, we're now working to provide more tools to aid that health department and utility uh, communication. So in our internal platform Decipher, we have utility reports that can be downloaded and provided directly to the utility that provide a subset of data and metrics. It's kind of a quick look at um, what is going on in your community, but we've provided that so that it's a very easy way for data sharing and that might promote further conversations. Now, of course, uh, we have to move beyond the utilities and also discuss community trust. And Amy discussed our implementation at state and jurisdiction levels um, very well already. But one of the things that we have found and we've heard from our partners is that community trust uh, in the data really uh, is bolstered by regular data sharing and um, also through communicating public health action. So how are these data being used? Are they being used to improve mitigation measure measures? Are they being used to help with resource allocation and help hospitals understand when surges might be coming? And on this slide, I have uh, one of our implementing partners dashboards that's public facing. This is separate from our COVID data tracker, but they use data uh, from our internal dashboard to cipher and they're able to create their own dashboards. And this can be tailored to community needs. This is one of several, I'm happy to say, dashboards that um, our implementing partners have created. But these types of tools to really bring the community in and involve them in the data uh, have been really valuable in promoting that trust and in educating the community on what wastewater data are, uh, what they can do, and what their limitations are. And one particularly valuable element of that is understanding how to integrate wastewater data with other surveillance data um, and really using it um, to better understand community health. So sharing that purpose and the why behind the data collection helps strengthen community buy-in and it also provides transparency in that we're collecting this data, but it's for this purpose. Um, and then it can help show the value of the data so that um, you know taxpayers know where their dollars are going and what they're supporting and how it's really helping keep their community safe. So to sum all of this up, uh, of course, we have our state health department expertise and support. They uh, have a great view of multiple communities within their state and uh, what priority areas may be. And we also try to have discussions with our health department partners to better understand what communities might uh, most benefit from wastewater surveillance, which might be historically under-resourced, uh, which may be vulnerable populations, especially rural communities, we're trying to reach them more. Uh, and as Amy mentioned, some communities may not be on a sewer system, and so this might not be the right solution for them. But for those that are interested, we really leverage expertise with our state health department partners to better understand how we can implement systems and how we can support them in expanding wastewater surveillance. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the graphic got a little bit squished. Um, also, uh, leveraging local health department expertise. Our state health departments um, have amazing expertise in so many levels, 
but our local health departments, we get really great feedback from them. And in some cases, um, in very large jurisdictions, the local health departments help us understand what's happening at a more granular level, and they can really help design wastewater systems, no limitations of the community, uh, whether that's the wastewater systems themselves or that are helping us understand, oh, is this a community that experiences a lot of tourism or is this one that is really more residential? Uh, and then, of course, utility infrastructure and knowledge, as I mentioned, that's really important in designing these systems. And then, of course, understanding public priorities for wastewater surveillance and for public health. What are they concerned about? Uh, throughout the pandemic, of course, there's been SARS-CoV-2, but as we move forward with looking at other targets, what are their priorities and, and what are they concerned about? And how do we communicate and educate them on um, what new targets we might be looking at and why we're looking at them? So part of really this public engagement is building trust. And one way that we're really interested in exploring further in the future is ethical considerations around wastewater surveillance. So this is a relatively new public health tool in the US and uh, wastewater samples are very rich. Uh, there are many microbes and there's a lot of genetic material. And currently, of course, there's no way to uh, have Ident individually identifiable genomic information in these samples, but uh, it's important to acknowledge how rich these samples are, especially when thinking about future use of samples. We also want to acknowledge that we're bridging environmental health and public health with wastewater surveillance. And while clinical uh, public health surveillance has precedence and guidance for ethical considerations, environmental health, um, especially with wastewater surveillance, is still growing in that area. And so we really want to try to bridge those two, those two important branches of wastewater surveillance so that we can better uh, tailor ethical considerations and communicate these to the public. Why are we using these data? What will they be used for in the future? What are limitations? And we've encountered some of this with um, jurisdictions' uh, concerns about surveillance data and how they communicate that to the community. And we think it's important to acknowledge that uh, and really listen to their priorities and concerns along the way so that we can better establish trust. So building trust in the system, a very complex uh, goal, but one way that we're hoping to do that is through ethical considerations. And so right now, ethical guidance surrounding wastewater surveillance uh, is largely at the local level or through academia. And when I say local, I, some in some cases, those are states or entire jurisdictions, but we don't have sort of a centralized guidance or considerations around wastewater surveillance ethics. And while this is valuable uh, and these efforts are really um, interesting and provide valuable insight into what we should consider, uh, at NEWS we feel that it's important to sort of bring this to the National Wastewater Surveillance System stage and uh, better consider these. And this is something we're really interested in the committee's feedback on. Uh, is how we can properly do that, that without too much bias um, from our side, but also engaging the right people in considering these ethical um, priorities. And so, especially for future use of wastewater data and samples, um, considering different relevant targets um, to public health, what pathogens are we looking at? Are we looking at um, chemical targets? Uh, why are we looking at these targets? Uh, is this because it's a pathogen that's very prevalent or is this really more specific to a certain community? And what will these data be used for? Um, is it for hospital uh, resource allocation? Um, and again, how will these data be communicated? So all of these factors um, just for different pathogen targets um, could be really important for ethical considerations. Archiving samples, particularly, um, future use is always unpredictable, but we have learned in public health history that future use can be fraught with um, ethical uh, mistakes and uh, violations, and that can really erode trust with communities, especially his communities that have been historically underserved or oppressed. And one of the valuable parts of wastewater surveillance is that we can use it to reach these communities and hope to find um, health disparities so that we can address them properly. But if, but first we have to build trust in those communities and maintain that trust. So 
understanding future use and what limitations might be around that. Um, we can't predict what technologies might come in the future, but in at least keeping this in mind, um, we can try to guide ethical principles around this. And then of course, social and political consequences of surveillance data. This is not uh, quite as relevant for SARS-CoV-2, but for future targets, whether that's pathogens or otherwise, uh, trying to better understand and ensure that there's no stigmatization of community. Um, so far, we've actually gotten positive feedback uh, that this wastewater surveillance for SARS-CoV-2 has not led to that. But um, for certain targets, we do wanna be mindful of that, um, that we're doing this for the good of the public health and um, the community and uh, that it's not misused in any way. So I mentioned that there are several efforts on ethical guidance um, on wastewater surveillance. One of them is not particularly on wastewater surveillance. It is general public health surveillance ethics guidance published by the WHO in 2017. And this has 17 different guidelines that are broadly applicable to public health surveillance. In some cases, not quite as applicable to wastewater surveillance. And that is where Canadian Water Network really did a lot of work in 2020 and 2021 to analyze those guidelines and tailor them to wastewater surveillance. A lot of their considerations focus on the use of the data, as well as data quality and how to communicate those data. Uh, currently, there have been some more recent academic group publications about ethical considerations in wastewater surveillance, which is really encouraging to see and always happy to see them sort of leading that and, and thinking ahead. But um, again, that's not particularly centralized. And uh, with state and local public health initiatives, those are also incredibly valuable. And on the news team, we wanna learn from those. Uh, every community will be different, but what are some central themes that we can find? And then on the legal side of ethics, um, the legality and sort of ownership of wastewater. So um, how, when you think about consent, um, when it's human waste, who exactly consents to that sampling? And currently it's the utilities um, because it is human waste and the sampling point is at the utility. And the EPA's Clean Water Act has some sections that are applicable. And um, they gave a great presentation at the Water Environment Federation Conference a few weeks ago. So, oh, I'm sorry again about this graphic, but um, there are some major ethical considerations that I've already mentioned, but um, just sort of major themes that we've seen so far is understanding the shared be benefits of surveillance, including how these data are used, but um, also posing those relative to potential risks. And a lot of these center on privacy. Um, very little in life has zero risk, but this is part of the WHO guidelines on public health surveillance as well, is really communicating the shared benefits of these surveillance programs. Uh, the opportunity and responsibility to address health equity issues um, and not only address them, but learn from the communities that are impacted by health disparities and uh, better tailor systems to serve their needs. Um, also respect for individuals and balancing that with a need for privacy. One beautiful thing about wastewater surveillance is that it is essentially a large community pooled sample. And so there aren't too many privacy concerns. We don't sample at a household level or even a neighborhood level, but um, just considering that and really communicating that to the public, that can be really important. Um, sometimes it's just uh, getting the answer to your question uh, that you need. And so thinking about that in wastewater surveillance ethics will also be really important, especially when you start thinking about facility level sampling. And then of course, the responsibility of those performing surveillance, um, the transparency and proper governance behind those structures, and then justice when it comes to misuse or violations of trust, um, how will that be handled? And so finally, I'd like to end on uh, a positive note that we have an opportunity to build in ethical integrity from the beginning. Uh, we have been building these systems for a little over a year, uh, and in some cases even more, but we have learned from history that um, public health has incredible benefits 
honor that and acknowledge it. Um, and while future use might be unpredictable, we can't exactly know where technologies are going. If we have regular review and input from served communities, from experts in public health and environmental health, then we can hope to uh, have these ethics evolve alongside the technologies um, so that we can have a really strong, trustworthy system that the public depends on um, for, for their data. And with that, um, I'm happy to answer questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we've got about five minutes for questions. Um, Scott, I see your hand up and go ahead. Sure. So Rachel, that's a very nice presentation for it. I, I'm, I'm struck by the fact uh, in Amy's talk, she talked about um, decentralized systems not really being included in this. Yet it strikes me, especially in the kind of the rural South um, and Southeast in particular, there are uh, a lot of these inequities or, or um, really may lie in that division between decentralized and centralized systems. And so what uh, consideration has that been given in your, your thinking? A good point. I think this is where, of course, um, we're going to have to learn from our partners um, in, in any ethical guidance that, that we create or that others, um, others create in partnership with us uh, because there are so many different systems. And as uh, some folks may discuss later on, every community and every utility is different and complex. And so understanding those decentralized systems um, and their needs and what ethical considerations we may have to give to them and tailoring that, it may just be that our ethical considerations are very extensive and have different applicabilities. Um, but that's something that we should certainly think about in the future. And one thing that I'm particularly interested in on feedback um, from the committee and from others is uh, some of our local and state jurisdictions who have been engaging with ethical discussions with their community, they have community representatives, um, a little bit similar to IRBs, um, where there's a member of the community who may be a trusted member um, who can then present community priorities, questions, and needs. Very difficult to do that on a federal level, but I would really be interested to hear how that might we may incorporate something similar to not only represent utilities and public health interests, but also um, really community questions and understand um, what their concerns are. So, um, but thank you for that question. That's something that we should certainly keep in mind in the future. All right, we've got uh, three questions, uh, Michelle, Reka, um, and then Rob. Yeah, so it'll be a little bit delayed going into our next um, talk, but that's okay. Uh, we wanna get those questions um, in there. So Michelle. Thanks so much for the information that you provided. I, I just picking up on the last question, I would like to hear more about whether you are currently hearing concerns from community groups, from members of the public, or is this at, more at the stage of kind of issue spotting potential concerns, but not yet needing to be responsive to stakeholder groups that have emerged in the public? So Happily, uh, it is the latter. Uh, we're thinking, we're trying to think more um, proactively about this. Um, we actually have heard some great feedback from our implementing partners that uh, the public really do value these data. And Zach will talk more about um, our public facing data on COVID data tracker. But uh, we think we've heard that one of the valuable aspects is that it's community level health. So really looking at your entire community and how COVID-19 transmission is going. Um, there were some concerns early on uh, at facility level sampling, and this was primarily with universities. Some jurisdictions had concerns about privacy. And so that's why I mentioned at facility specific levels, um, particularly when you think about um, if it's maybe a correctionals facility or, or something like a dorm, um, really understanding how that data will be used is very important. So while we haven't received much feedback on ethical concerns um, from the public at this point, we want to be forward thinking and start trying to incorporate them now um, so that in the future, as we expand wastewater surveillance, uh, that we at least have that in mind. And there might be some concerns that come up in the future that we haven't even thought of yet. But um, yeah, that's so that's kind of where we are. It's sort of proactive thinking. 
Rebecca. So uh, thank you, Rachel. It was uh, great to hear your talk in detail. I, I am. I was always working with you to enroll more sites from Virginia, and uh, thank you for your support there too. Uh, oh, we have lots of sites in uh, commercial contract and, and under our community surveillance. And thankfully we got really good positive feedback from our public. We didn't, we never heard any concerns so far, but a lot of interest in this data. Um, my uh, question is that, um, like as you said, this data uh, is very rich and um, uh, we need to work on ethical uh, framework and guidance. So, um, and you just mentioned we are taking a proactive approach than reactive. So can you just explain that a little bit more like how, where we are and how long will it take to uh, set up a solid framework there? So on the CDC side, we're working on the news team to sort of better understand core ethical principles that we want to prioritize moving forward. But um, thinking about ethics as a whole, uh, especially around wastewater surveillance, um, we are really interested in hearing from the committee and, and from others, um, potential solutions for an ethic, ethical evaluation or ethic considerations um, that is not run by us because we are running the National Wastewater Surveillance System and it would be inherently biased if we created the ethics for wastewater surveillance. And of course, we are not the only stakeholder. Um, there are so many other leaders are implementing jurisdictions. Um, we're so glad to have um, Virginia's participation, but um, we want to have it as a balanced approach. So we would value having a seat at the table, but um, we're interested in finding the best possible way of having these ethical principles shaped um, by as, as many stakeholders as we can. And we can't, of course, include literally everyone, but um, we would value the opportunity and any ideas that people have on how we could best do that, how it may have been done with other systems um, so that uh, we're not providing uh, biased guidance. Rob. Um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Rachel, for a great uh, presentation there. Um, I was intrigued by your comments on future use, which obviously is very uh, important ethical consideration. Um, are there any specific future uses that you're concerned about with these samples? Um, say, for example, reprocessing them for, uh, uh, for, for drugs, uh, reprocessing them to identify individual human subjects who might be in a particular uh, catchment region or that kind of thing? Or is it more of a precautionary principle where you think there might be some future use that people would complain about, but you haven't figured out what that future use would be yet? Or is it a mixture of both of those? So it's a little bit of both. Um, as you mentioned, so if wastewater samples are archived, one of our um, considerations and concerns is who will have access to those samples? Who will be able to request access and how will they be used? Um, as you mentioned, things like illicit drugs. Um, in some ways, uh, we're seeing epidemics of drug use throughout the country. And so it is a public health issue, but there are also stakeholders in that on law enforcement side. And we want to be mindful of that in that um, could these samples be used um, for something other than public health? And so illicit drugs is something that comes to mind. Um, in certain cases, depending on the granularity, um, there could be pathogens that may be stigmatizing. Um, that is more of a theoretical concern um, because our, our primary pathogens that we're hoping to target in the future are things like food born pathogens and have a very clear public health use. But I think uh, the central concern right now is sort of where that, that line blurs between public health use and other use, whether that's for law enforcement, um, whether that's private use of samples um, for, some, I, for some type of campaign. Um, that is a much more theoretical um, concern. And of course, in the future, not exactly sure what technologies would be available. So what could you glean from these wastewater samples? Um, how could this be used in other ways? But one of the primary concerns um, right now is essentially what target would be used and 
essentially who would have access to the samples to, to look for those targets. Um, we just want to ensure that any samples would be used for the good of public health and, and um, not, for, not for any other unintended use that um, could concern a community. Grace, thank you. And our last question, Lauren. Thank you. Um, so I, my question is about um, samples that are not collected by news. Um, we are, I mean, in my experience, we have researchers that um, would like to have samples. And um, I'm thinking about the, the in, in, you know, the idea of having something like an IRB or some kind of committee that looks at the use of samples. Um, and the way we deal with it now is we have like, at least in Houston, we have perhaps an MOU with another, um, with the utility um, and, and the researcher that's looking into the sample. But um, I'm struck by, I think your presentation indicating that we really don't want to put more regulation on the utility. It's a lot of burden on them. Um, people requesting additional samples and how the flow would go. Are we going to try to restrict who gets, you know, the um, the samples that are going forward? Not necessarily in the framework of the news system. And I didn't know if you'd thought about that. So that is a wonderful point. I'm really glad you brought that up um, about avoiding more intensive or additional regulations on utilities. Um, sometimes when uh, sometimes when interacting with utilities, of course, when sampling starts, um, there's concern, like, is this leading to another regulation? Is this something else that we need to start preparing for? And our goal at News right now is not to um, increase regulations on utilities. Um, we value the samples that they provide us and we wanna support them, but you are right that we don't want to start um, overburdening them, whether with requests for samples or um, with any regulations surrounding that. So I think um, when I mentioned bringing environmental health partners to the table, that would be important to bring utility partners as part of that, of course. Um, and, and better understand sort of what would be the limitations. Um, there may be a finite amount of sample and that may just be the case, especially initially, um, but that is something that would probably have to evolve as the system grows um, and as interest in wastewater surveillance grows. Right now it's primarily focused on SARS-CoV-2, but if it does blossom into foodborne, foodborne illness um, surveillance, and there's significant in interest in that, we would probably need to review the ethics surrounding that and also the capacity of utilities and keep that in mind. So that is some, that's a really interesting point. Um, and thank you for, for bringing that up. That's something we should certainly think about. All right. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was um, very much appreciated and the question's very helpful as well. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Zach Marsh. Um, Zach is an epidemiologist at CDC and is going to speak around data analysis and use. Great, thanks all. Um, let me just get my video started. Okay, so um, I'm gonna keep my video on, but if we start to hear any degradation in audio, just let me know, I'll cut it off. Um, so like, like I was introduced, my name is Zach Marsh. I'm the data and epidemiology lead at the National Wastewater Surveillance System. And I just wanna give a really quick overview of um, our data analysis and use. Um, so you've heard a bit more about the implementation of wastewater surveillance, but um, what happens whenever uh, data get to us and, and what do we do with it? Let me see if I can get it to advance. There we go. So uh, a slide you certainly haven't seen today already, um, but really what I'm gonna focus on here is in the upper right quadrant. So um, from the data submission component all the way over um, through data analysis and information sharing. And, and so um, what are we doing with these data? So as Amy mentioned, uh, one of the first considerations um, and, and really key values that news brings to wastewater surveillance is this national standardization of data. Um, so making sure what's being captured um, and compiled by CDC is comparable. Um, the methods may be different, but um, the data that we are collecting um, is similar it does go through the same data quality standards. It does get the same exact data quality review. Um, and, it, and it really helps to make um, comparison of these national level data much easier. Um, so what I've highlighted here with the graphic is just the, the different components that we capture with news data. 
Um, so we get information on the wastewater treatment plant, um, where it's located, what its capacities are, um, what additional inputs there may be into that system. Uh, we get information about uh, what is uh, what are the factors at sample collection. So what the, the day is, what uh, pH, conductivity, other factors, uh, what the flow was at that system during that time, the type of sample that was captured. Uh, and then we get information after the sample has been submitted to the laboratory um, on what exactly they did to process that sample to get the SARS-CoV-2 concentrations at the end, uh, which is really the final um, piece of information. So we get test results and all the associated metadata with that, uh, that PCR result. Um, so after all these data components are um, compiled into our submission template, we receive it um, in our data platform at CDC. Um, once it's uploaded, it goes through some automated quality control checks um, that are applied to all data in our system. And so if they don't meet the data standards, they're not going to pass along to our analysis, which is also an automated component. So once we have the, um, these error-free data, so we've gone through the, the quality control check, um, we have an analysis pipeline that's built within the same platform that data are submitted and visualized. Um, as soon as these data are received, they, they initiate in the pipeline. So this is about as near real time as any surveillance platform I've worked on. Um, it takes probably from submission to visualization 15 minutes to an hour um, to, to be able to see the most recent samples that, that a utility or not a utility, a, a jurisdiction is uploading to us. Um, so the first step whenever we um, start to an analyze these data are to take the concentrations. Uh, and to normalize them. So we have two different approaches there. Uh, we do flow and population normalization, and that really helps to account for um, the number of people contributing waste and also the flow rate. Um, as, as many of you may know, um, there can be different uh, contributions beyond just household waste. There can be industrial contributions. Um, there can also be stormwater combined systems with sewage. And so uh, understanding the flow is really important to, to know what dilution factors may be um, present within the wastewater system. We also can look at factors um, that we call human endogenous control. So examples being pet per mild model virus. Um, and, and that allows us to um, have a bit of a control um, that um, is inherent in the feces that are excreted within the system. And so um, this helps us to get a bit more to a per person contribution of, of the SARS-CoV-2. So after we've done this normalization, um, we then go through and process some metrics that we have within our system. Um, these metrics are calculated on the per site and target level. So we can receive PCR results for total SARS-CoV-2, which is what we often are talking about when we're discussing wastewater. But we can also look at specific um, mutations within um, uh, the, the genome that are, are very um, specific to variants of concern, so Delta and Omicron. Um, so the, the three primary metrics that we have, um, and, and you'll get to see some visualizations of those on subsequent slides. Um, first and foremost, we have a percent change. So our wastewater levels going up or down within a given sampling location. Um, this is performed by a time-based linear regression. So we take all the samples within the given time period, and we run a re regression on them over the number of days. Um, to see what uh, the trajectory of those concentrations are at that location. Um, and then just to back, back calculate that from the linear regression, um, we multiply the slope by the number of days included within the time period, um, just to oversimplify that. The next metric we have is a relative level. Um, this is the most recent metric we've released publicly. Um, it takes all the wastewater concentrations for a given sampling site um, since they started collecting. Um, it orders them and it gives a sense of how high or low our levels at a sampling location compared to how they've been historically. Um, looking at when sampling started is a really important consideration that I'll talk about in some of the challenges later on. Um, but this is really helpful to understand uh, where a given location is compared to where it's been um, throughout the pandemic. And then the final um, metric that we have is a detection proportion. So really simple. It's the number of samples that were tested. Um, and then you divide how many of those samples um, had detectable virus. So uh, among all the samples that have been conducted in the last 15 days, uh, what proportion of those found SARS-CoV-2? And so this is um, not so helpful when you're in a higher incident state, but as we're getting to lower incident states as we are now, uh, it, it really helps to drive home 
um, where and where you were not detecting um, coronavirus within communities. So this is one of the dashboards that we have available. This is our internal Decipher dashboard, Decipher being the data platform we operate um, news within. Um, so I'm gonna walk through a few of the key visuals that we have available to health departments um, to help drive those public health decisions that they have um, that they have to make based on these wastewater data. So in the top left, um, when you load up the, the visualization dashboard we have, you're met with a national level map and each sampling site is represented by a point. Um, and the point currently as shown in this figure is colored based on the percent change. And so our wastewater levels going up, which are, are the red, the orange and yellows, or are they going down, which are represented by the blue colors. And so this gives a, a national perspective of what's going on in a community. Um, you can zoom in to see smaller geographies, you can select points, um, and it, you can also change the metrics. So we can view all three of those metrics I highlighted on the previous page on this national level map. If you then zoom in, I'm gonna use North Carolina as an example here. Um, you can um, apply some spatial layers that we really think help to provide that context to what's going on in the community. So we've ingested some spatial data um, on things like vaccination, testing, cases, hospitalization and we are displaying that at the county level. So what you're seeing here is the uh, proportion of the total population that has at least one vaccine dose. And so you can have these data um, um, underlaid with the wastewater testing data on top. So that may provide that additional context to understand why some communities are seeing increases, whereas others are seeing decreases, or if there's any, anything at the county level that may explain why you're seeing clustering of cases um, or clustering of increasing wastewater levels that you might not be seeing um, in other areas of your jurisdiction. So if you click on, a, on an individual point, there's a, an entire charts pane that appears in the dashboard. And so that's showing a couple of the visuals in three and four. So um, the visual three is probably one of our most popular. Um, there's a few different data components that are displayed here. So on a, for this individual site, if you've selected one of these, these points on the map, you get to see the wastewater concentration data um, that's shown by the dark gray points and the dark gray line, which is just a smooth line of the concentrations. In the back, um, the lighter gray color and bars, um, that is the sewer shed level case data. So that's something that Amy had mentioned um, in one of her answers. Um, so some of our jurisdictions have taken their sewer shed level spatial data. So the shape files that represent those service boundaries and they geocode cases to those geographies. And what you get is you can see over time what the cases in that specific catchment area that we're, we're sampling wastewater look like for cases. And so as you can see here, um, we're seeing that really nice um, leading indication with the Omicron peak in December and January at this site, um, just before you start to see the, the respective increase of those cases um, in this sampling location. So, and then um, in number four here at the very bottom, uh, this is displaying a heat map that we show within Decipher for a, a given jurisdiction. So these are all of the North Carolina sampling sites. And what this is showing is a time series. So each line on this chart represents all of the samples um, over time for that location with the, the location you've selected denoted with this rhombus or diamond shape. Um, and so this is a really helpful visual to see how wastewater levels presently, which is represented on the far right compared to what's being sampled over time since sampling started. And so this both gives you how things look presently um, within a site, but you, you can also compare sites that started sampling around the same time period to each other to see if levels in some locations are higher than in others. So in addition to this Decipher internal dashboard that I just walked you through, we have three different data products that are used by um, uh, different audiences and, and they were designed um, as uh, slightly differently for that very reason. Um, so the Decipher dashboard provides much more granular data. Um, you can really dive into super specific location information. You can see the sewer shed shape files that represent where these locations are um, geographically. Uh, you can see full-time histories. You can download data um, from our dashboard if you want to do additional analyses. Um, some jurisdictions choose to use it on their own internal dashboards. Um, we also have um, a COVID data tracker. So the, this is our public-facing wastewater dashboard. Um, it's 
just went through its second revision. So we now show percent change, detection proportion, and the most recent additions we had were showing um, the current levels. So how high or lower wastewater levels um, compared to how high they've been since December 1st. Um, that's shown in the top right screenshot there. That's a, a screenshot of our COVID data tracker site. And then um, we also have a couple different uh, weekly reports that we put together um, for agency and White House level leadership. So um, there's a weekly report that we run that's been generated in R and, and that's really used to keep national level awareness of what's going on. Um, and then we have a bi-weekly slide we put together for the White House that highlights some areas that we're keeping a close watch on based on their current um, wastewater trends. So these, uh, these different products have um, different audiences um, and as a result, the, the intended use for each of these are, are different. So the internal dashboards are really for health departments to see what's going on in their data and, and use it to drive that public health action, which is why we provide many different data sources together in the same location. COVID Data Tracker is really for public um, to use this to inform their own decisions to see what's going on in their communities or the neighboring communities to, to make the decisions that are best for themselves and, and for their families. Um, and then these weekly reports really are meant to just provide high level awareness to agency leadership and, and White House COVID leadership to make sure they know um, what wastewater data are showing, where areas might be emerging um, as far as um, disease goes, um, and then use that to inform decisions and other recommendations that they might be putting out. These data, um, as, as great as they can be with all the benefits Amy has highlighted, uh, such as the healthcare agnostic nature, um, being very quick to get um, actionable data, they're, they're not without challenges and, um, and issues that we have been working through trying to solve. Um, the big one is the data comparability. Um, so in addition to just variability with testing methods, there's also variability in wastewater infrastructure. So the systems themselves have different times of residence. So the time it takes to go from a household to a treatment plant may differ. There's different inputs like I highlighted, such as stormwater or um, industrial waste um, that may have chemicals that degrade the, the viral RNA. Um, and then wastewater is a community sample. It, it's a pooled sample and it's, it's based on the input from that community. Um, that includes people who may be traveling to a community that don't live there. So tourism does impact wastewater surveillance. Um, and so it's important to keep that in mind. Um, as I, as I uh, showed on the relative levels heat map, you can see that within a given jurisdiction, when a sample was started or when a site started uh, collecting wastewater, it impacts what the current picture is. So if you look at these top sites, um, they started sampling much later than some of the lower locations. And so they didn't necessarily sample during these peak periods um, of Omicron. So what they're seeing right now as relatively high might be different from those who sampled during the peak of Delta or Omicron within the pandemic. And so they don't have that pandemic memory um, is what we've coined that, that other sites may have that have been sampling for longer. And that impacts interpretation. And then it's important to keep in mind when looking at uh, wastewater level. And then the last challenge is really just data coverage. Um, we've highlighted and talked about the, the variability in geographic coverage, but there's also sampling frequencies that can be challenging too. Um, some sites do as, as high as five or seven samples per week, um, and others do one sample that we get per week. And when you do these analyses, um, sometimes that's not apparent. And so it, it's important to keep in mind that these uh, these cov the coverage and also the, the temporal coverage may vary. Um, Amy highlighted the, the septic challenge that we have where these people may just not be able to be covered. Um, there are also challenges with aggregating to higher geographies that many in public health often like to do of giving county level summaries, state level summaries, national level summaries of what's going on. And because of the variability in, in spatial and temporal coverage, um, that can sometimes be a challenge and so that's why we often look at, at wastewater data on a site basis, because this is a hyper-local metric, uh, and it's really important to keep, uh, keep that in mind. There are, are ways that we're exploring to aggregate, but um, it does present challenges on how to make sure it's representative of the number of sampling locations within a given geography. And um, I think that's no, one more thing. So 
Um, obviously, there's been a lot, as Amy's highlighted, that we've done as a system, but there's still much to be done and uh, much we can do. And so some of the future things we have ongoing or, or we plan to, to incorporate in the future, um, we're looking at ways to evaluate different percent change calculations to account for sampling, frequency, um, factors that are intrinsic to the wastewater systems to make these percent change um, calculations a bit more comparable, maybe less sensitive in lower incident settings. Um, we also are looking at ways to um, use lessons learned from other systems that have developed these alert algorithms to identify meaningful increases. Um, so we are working closely with our syndromic surveillance colleagues who have some really great algorithms they've developed um, to identify what meaningful increases may be occurring in wastewater and, and to be able to parse out that noise that um, sometimes is inherent in an environmental signal at a community level like wastewater. Um, to address some of the tourism challenges or population movement challenges, um, CDC is acquiring some mobility data sets. And so we might be able to use that in the future to observe what's going on in these communities to see if um, mobility and, and increased tourism might be accounting for increasing levels or um, to discount that is happening and, and maybe um, help us to confirm that what we're seeing is, is based on the residents of those communities. And, and then the last thing that we're actively working on right now is the ingestion analysis and visualization of the wastewater sequence data that um, many jurisdictions in our commercial contractor are, are collecting and then pairing that on the same internal wastewater dashboard that we have um, with the PCR testing data. So it provides that complete picture of variance um, in addition to just levels and, and trajectories so that people understand what might be driving um, the, the different levels and, and concentrations that they're seeing. So I think that's all I have um, and happy to take any questions given the time. Thank you, Zach. Um, very helpful and, and Certainly, our committee members have learned how to game the system by raising their hands before the presentation is over, which is the evidence that we have a very intelligent committee. Um, Scott. Uh, I, I jump in a, jumping at the bit here on this one. I've got, I've got several questions for you. I'll try to streamline them into two lines of thinking here. The first is around the, the normalization of data. And I'm, I'm curious if you can provide us some information around this why you're using a, a biological indicator like mild model pepper virus, which has natural variability of a couple orders of magnitude in addition, and how you're factoring that variability into your normalization. Um, that's my first question. The second question comes down to the matrix effect really in the individual samples. And you said there's variability within the individual infrastructures, but there actually can be a significant amount of variability between samples as well with precipitation and just overall wastewater strength. And that can lead to single samples that have significant uh, signal increases, particularly if you're normalizing with, with indicators. Um, how is that having an effect on your, your, your metrics in particular? Because I know um, initially people talked about trends analysis, but single samples that are three orders of magnitude higher may drive that trend for a very long time, even though it is a, a spurious result potentially. Um, and then I also have this question, the, the metrics piece. Um, a lot of uh, the utilities have changed methods since they began um, as methods have evolved. And so how is that accounted for in that uh, overall um, historical metric that you're using? So those three questions, the historical metric, the normalization data, and the matrix effect on single samples. Yeah, those are, those are really great questions and they're certainly the things that we've been trying to tackle. Um, to, I'll, I'll answer them in order in which they were asked if I, if I can recall them. Um, so getting back to the human endogenous factors, um, we actually don't restrict it just to one. Um, we allow a variety of different factors to be reported. So. Um, anywhere from chemicals to um, microbial indicators. Um, and so um, we haven't really done an in-depth analysis as to the, the variability within those. That's certainly something that we're, we're wanting to explore in the future. Um, it, it certainly does have an impact. I think some are looking at uh, things like caffeine or, or other factors that maybe have a more stable um, uh, lifespan or, or stable coverage and are not dependent on diet as heavily, um, though certainly caffeine does have a diet dependency. 
Um, but it, it's something we'd like to look into more. Um, regarding the variability of the matrix, um, yeah, the, the trends factor is actually something we're looking at now with our, some of our statisticians to see um, if they're, if we incorporate these additional um, infrastructure level factors and in different contributions to the wastewater network, does that help to smooth out and, and eliminate or at least um, dampen some of the noise that are inherent. Um, if you look at the point level data on that figure I showed, um, you, you do see spikes here and there um, that sometimes uh, we're not clear if it's a, a factor of the system, if it's uh, an actual signal, or if it has to do with population changes. Um, and so something else I'm really curious about is if we can use mobility data to get a better grasp on what the true quote unquote population served for the system is rather than just relying on um, what utilities report to be their population served, because having that dynamic value might help us to better um, account for large changes and swings in population. Um, and then the last one regarding the methods, uh, we do actually account for changes in major lab methods. So a, a jurisdiction will report if they've changed an assay or they're using a different supplier or whatever it may be that they feel um, has deemed their results um, incomparable now. And so uh, we, we use this field called major lab methods within our analysis, and we don't analyze samples that were captured using different methods. Um, and um, I didn't show an example of a site that has changed, but um, we do have some states that are starting to consolidate their testing within their own state lab. And, and so um, we're not going to be showing compared metrics or, or other trends for those sites that have since changed the method. Um, we only compare data since the new method has begun. And, and you'll notice on our COVID data tracker site, if you click on sites that have since changed, uh, the concentration time series won't be available for those locations just so you avoid that direct comparison of location. All right, thank you. Just um, so, so those of you joining, we're gonna go till about 15 after um, because we do wanna get all these, these questions in um, as well. Christine. Thank you, Zach. That was that was really um, really exciting, and I think the dashboard work that you've done is incredibly impressive, especially over such a short period of time. I think we're going to be really interested in the data that you were showing around the lead time between the detection in wastewater and cases reported in the community within sort of that sewer shed as you're describing it. And I'm wondering if you have any data on sort of the the number of days, if there's variation in the number of days by state or utility and just sort of what that, what that metric is looking like. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We, at the very early stages of the system, probably back in 2020, so before we had all the variability and we, we had new variants and everything, we, we'd looked at um, the timing of uh, wastewater in cases. And it was found that around four to six days was the typical lead time you would see um, with wastewater relative to the case data. Um, we think there's been some change, obviously with different uh, surveillance biases that are inherent in the systems. Um, different states have different case reporting capacities. Um, their clinical testing may be very robust and, and so they may get results very soon. And obviously that's going to shorten the time that wastewater has on clinical testing if, if they've established near real-time data transfers, if they have really quick, rapid antigen testing or other mechanisms to get these data, um, that, that's gonna make wastewater less of a leading indicator. Um, but I think on, on the average, um, especially now that we're seeing uh, less clinical testing, um, wastewater is certainly being viewed much more, um, uh, I guess, closely because the, the data that are available out there for clinical testing are becoming less and less reliable. Um, the reporting frequency over just the past few weeks we've heard has decreased in most places to weekly. And so that certainly means we need to reevaluate how wastewater um, leads other indicators. Michelle. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was interested to learn more about the data that are currently accessible to any member of the public. What can they download and at what level of geographic specificity? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So we, we have a few mechanisms for people to access data. 
Um, the easiest um, that doesn't require them interacting with us at all is they can download the current data that are shown on the COVID data tracker site. Um, so all of those metrics at the sampling location level, um, we're not providing the names of the wastewater treatment plants themselves. We anonymize that, um, but it, it is um, whatever data is shown on that, on that dashboard is available for download. We also have two data repositories on a public data sharing site called data.cdc.gov. So the full history of what's being shown on COVID data tracker, including the smooth wastewater concentrations at the sampling site level are available for download there. Um, and then we also have a public data request process where people can request much more detailed information. We still anonymize the wastewater treatment plant, but they can request the full, I think it's around 200 analytics variables that we have available, including um, the laboratory metadata, um, the wastewater infrastructure metadata. Um, and I think we filled, fulfilled around 10 or 12 uh, data requests to the state. Um, most of them have been academic researchers, but anybody in the public just has to sign a data use agreement um, and then uh, we release that to them. All right, Reka. Thank you, John, for a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, my question is kind of, uh, I think you touched a little bit on that in your last slide when you were talking about future plans uh, for a data trend. So um, on COVID data tracker, you are right now showing 15 day percent change uh, trends. And uh, some of the jurisdictions, they are not uh, getting samples bi-weekly, they are still collecting once a week sample. So for th those uh, jurisdictions, we cannot see any data on COVID data tracker. There are gray bars, uh, gray dots. And we get lots of questions from our uh, community partners, our uh, stakeholders, uh, curious Virginians. They always ask uh, why uh, we don't have any data, are you not reporting or something like that. So are you planning to change that to something different so that you can accommodate all the jurisdictions? Yeah, we, we talked a lot about the time period that we wanted to represent data on. Um, and with that percent change metric, we were really, um, we really wanted to make sure data were represented on a timely basis. So what's the most recent data we have? Um, we, I think the biggest concern we have is if we show longer time periods, then what, is, what does someone do with that? If you're showing data from a month ago, like how informative is that, especially in a pandemic that can change so quickly? Um, we, we are talking about in the third iteration to allow some date um, modification so you can select different time periods to look back over time, um, which would in, increase the amount of recent data available and, and so current metrics shown. Um, but I really think part of why we uh, focused on such the, a recent time period is, is really just to make sure that people are seeing up-to-date data, knowing what's going on in near real time in their communities and, and not showing data that are old that may be confusing, um, especially um, if we allowed the most recent sample for a location to be shown. There, there's a lot of confusion that could result there if that's a month and a half old and they're looking at data that are three days old. Um, and so knowing um, what the most recent results are, we, we really just had to be pretty uh, strict in, in enforcing uh, the more recent data only to be shown. Thank you. Raul. Um, hey, Zach. Um, I'm just circling back to the limit of detection problem that that or challenge that Amy brought up um, uh, in her talk. And I noticed in, in your talk how that LOD can affect like some of this data interpretation. Would you guys ever have interest in recommending a target LOD or LOQ? Yeah, I, I don't know if we'd make recommendations. Um, that's probably, I'm gonna start talking over my skis here and probably best to have Rory or somebody on our lab side answer that. but. Um, we, we do capture the limit of detection for the assays within our data, um, and we, we consider that when we're doing analyses, if something's below the limit of detection, which, like, as you're alluding to, can't be quite variable depending on the assay that's being used. I think once we are moving towards this digital platform, I think we're going to get to a better state where we can start putting those frameworks in place 
um, that that do have minimal requirements, um, particularly uh, as we're hoping um, to be able to have more comparable lab, lab data in the future. There comes with the ability to have a lot more specifications, but um, I, I don't know if we're at that point now with the wide array of methods that some assays and some instruments just may not be able to achieve um, an ideal LOD or LOQ that we, we would want to have. Niraj. Um, Zach, I had a question kind of similar to what Christine asked, which is if these data were say a leading indicator of hospitalizations of de or deaths rather than say just some cases, do you have a sense of like how sensitive or specific they are? So for example, if in an area I find death spike can I go back and see a red bar three weeks before that spike in death? And what is the fraction of times I would see a red bar or the other way around that I see a red bar? What is the chance that I'm going to see a spike in deaths or hospitalizations three weeks from now? Yeah, the severe disease question is, is always the, the big million dollar one. I think the challenge with wastewater data are because it is healthcare agnostic and we can pick up symptomatic and asymptomatic cases, the challenge becomes parsing out what proportion of what you're detecting is from those who don't have symptoms, thus they're le less likely to seek care, thus they're less likely to be um, hospitalized and die. Um, so I think when we wanna start thinking about can we project out severe disease, looking at variants or um, mutations of high consequence, so there's lots of talk about um, being able to look at mutations that may be able to escape treatments or, or may in the future have um, like vaccine escape. Um, I think that's where we can start to, to look into severe disease. But I think when we just look at this pooled sample without understanding more about um, what the proportion of symptomatic versus asymptomatic cases, we, we can maybe use vaccine um, and vaccine coverage to serve as a bit of a proxy for protection, but even that sometimes is difficult to extrapolate out. It, it's certainly something we're talking about um, beginning to explore, particularly as we're getting into sequencing as, as to whether we can use sequence data to inform um, the likelihood of what we're picking up to result in the severe um, disease that you're talking about. But is there, uh, just to clarify, is there any current analysis that shows that these data are good for predicting severe disease? Not, not a strong analysis that I've seen. Um, we, we know that the time period is roughly a couple weeks to three weeks from spikes in wastewater to the representative spikes in cases. Most of that is just the correlation to case spikes. And then it takes a little bit longer, typically about a week or so for those people to start showing up in the hospital. But I don't know, it, I know I haven't, um, but I'm not sure if others have begun to investigate whether there's that representative um, spike in, in that severe disease component of hospitalization and death that we're seeing in wastewater. It's certainly one of the things that we're starting to look at as we're identifying these meaningful thresholds. And as, uh, as we look back, I think um, we're gonna start to evaluate things like that to see if they, there are those correlates with, um, with the severe disease. Thank you. Lauren. Hey, Zach. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to talk to you about um, specifically one of our tasks is um, to discuss broad approaches to increase the public health impact of wastewater surveillance. And when I was thinking about your talk, you mentioned briefly about sampling. Um, and I wanted to, I guess, get your thoughts on on both the, the temporal frequency and, and variation in sampling by space. Um, we've seen papers out there that indicate, you know, if it's a vulnerable community and we don't have really good indicator data for them, maybe those are places that we should sample more frequently than say a community that has, you know, well-established um, either the vaccine race, like you just mentioned, or good uh, syndromic surveillance or essence data. If we really kind of know what's going on in a community, maybe we could take our, our resources because you know we have only some so much funding um and step back on the communities that we really understand and sample them at some frequency then if we see something happening happening in one of these vulnerable communities we step it up um you know maybe trigger something is that something that you're thinking about 
Yeah, I don't I don't know if it's something we've explicitly thought about scaling based on need. I, I know we certainly are being very intentional with this commercial contract to talk, to try and focus on more vulnerable communities. So two of the factors we, we considered when we were identifying priority sites were looking at counties with lower vaccination coverage. Um, and then we also looked at CDC's social vulnerability index to see if um, we could make sure we had really good representative coverage of those communities, like you're saying, that are more likely to be impacted by increasing uh, COVID transmission. Um, I, I think it's certainly worth considering, um, particularly with upstream sampling, when maybe a, a community is looking at doing central testing more frequently at, at the plant, and then as um, pockets of disease are maybe being identified or um, or there's concern that pockets of disease may not be captured as well with other indicators, we can think about um, upstream sampling. I know you all in Houston do lots of um, smaller scale sampling throughout your, your city to make sure that you have adequate coverage. And so um, it seems like a combination of the two might be helpful. Um, looking at both just traditional surveillance coverage, access to healthcare, and then what the vulnerabilities may be in those communities to help um, prioritize where the sampling occurs. I think yeah. what's what's really important though is just the duration and consistency of sampling. If you don't have that historic perspective, it, it can be challenging some sometimes to know if what you're seeing is um, is a meaningful trend or if it's just an artifact because you just started sampling there and you don't really have a good grasp on what the, the baseline levels are, especially as we start thinking about is COVID going to become just an endemic disease and we have a better handling on what uh, typical expected levels might be. Right. So I, I just had this really quick follow up. I'm sneaking in. <laughs> um, have you, um, when you, so it, it sounds like you have a lot of data where there are people reporting on the weekly basis, and then you have ones that are reporting twice a week. And have you done a cross validation where you can see like, was there like a great impact of the two, two times a week versus the one? But, uh, I think we landed on the twice weekly because we found it has, there's, there's better, um, responsiveness to the data. And that's that's why we've encouraged twice weekly sampling, just because with most of our measurements, they're either time or measurement based. So obviously, the more frequently you're sampling, the more frequently you can have new trends that also can introduce additional noise. So we felt um, really honing in on twice weekly sampling gave a good balance of not only sensitivity of the assays and, and the system, but also it was not overwhelming for the utility operators. Um, they're completely new to public health surveillance. And so keeping in mind their capacities and, and willingness to participate, not burn them out was um, also a consideration. So um, we don't have any great data on within a site if they've changed different sampling frequencies of whether or not it improves um, resolution of what's going on. But um, I, I think that's a really interesting um, evaluation that maybe some of our centers of excellence or, or other um, groups that we're looking to fund in the next cycle can start to investigate. All right, Krista, last question. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for talking. And I'm just going to build on this resolution question. On the public facing website, you know, it, is there, does it currently show um, how many data points have gone into those trends? Because I'm thinking, you know, the people who look at the website might trust a trend more if it's based on daily samples as opposed to weekly or biweekly. Is there a way to, sh do you show that? And if not, why, 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 why not? We don't yet. It's something that we need to, um, particularly as we're showing percent change, because sometimes uh, a location represents two samples over that 15 day period um, and others represent uh, as many as like 10. And so that's something that we're, we're going to probably be adding in the next round is is that and also showing the most recent sample date, just so it's clear of when in that 15 day period, the most recent sample was collected. All right, thank you. And, and thank you again, Zach. Um, we're now going to break until one o'clock uh, Eastern time and then we'll reconvene. So thank you all of the presenters this morning. That's very, very, very helpful. All right, um, welcome back everyone. Um, we're next going to hear from um, several of our speakers around some of the, the challenges and concerns um, regarding implementing a national wastewater surveillance system. Um, before I introduce my first our first speaker, I also want to give um, Marissa a chance to introduce herself. She's just joined us um, 
she's a committee member. Marissa. Hi, yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay? No, nope. need it until it turns red. There you go. Okay, there we go. Better? All right. Um, so yeah, hi, I, I just wanted to say hello. I'm a faculty at the University of Michigan in epidemiology and complex systems. And uh, I I don't know how much introduction I was supposed to give. Is that the whole deal or more? <laughs> I, I do a lot of work on uh, mathematical modeling, including uh, of, of infectious diseases, but also of, of wastewater surveillance and, and that kind of thing. And I've, I've worked on polio and COVID with wastewater. And yeah, that's, that's the, there we go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I want to um, introduce Nathan LaCrosse. He's with the um, Utah Department of Health, and he's going to speak to us um, about the opportunities and limitations of syndromic versus wastewater disease surveillance data. So, Nathan. Hello. Thank you. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, appreciate the invitation to speak. So I'm going to be talking a bit, as Guy mentioned, about uh, wastewater surveillance, a little bit about syndromic surveillance. I manage our wastewater surveillance program. I'm not an expert in syndromic surveillance, although we do have some very, I think, uh, fruitful and encouraging collaborations with our syndromic surveillance program ongoing um, that I can speak to. So I'll get, let's see, there, oh, too far. There we go. Okay, just a little bit of lag. So very briefly, I um, want to describe what we're actually talking about with wastewater surveillance and syndromic surveillance. Wastewater surveillance, um, you know, Amy, Rachel, and Zach did a great job of introducing a lot of the concepts, um, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, and I do want to mention that the points I'm going to be talking about are going to be related to the systems and data we have in place in Utah. They're going to be different in other areas, of course, naturally speaking. So with wastewater surveillance, as has already been mentioned, we're largely talking about community level surveillance, although it certainly can be done at different levels down to single buildings, uh, potentially. Um, really anywhere you can sample. In Utah, currently it's all community level surveillance of quite a wide ranges of community sizes. Uh, the data and samples, typically they're collected new. You're, you're not use, making use of existing data. Although with a caveat that Whenever possible, um, it's good, in my opinion, to try to piggyback on existing sampling schedules that the per partner facilities are already conducting just to ease the burden, streamline things, make things even more efficient. But typically, this is new data, they're new samples. It's not something that already exists. You're collecting it for this purpose. And the turnaround time varies. Um, you know, Zach gave some national perspectives. In Utah, for us, it's typically in the neighborhood of two to three business days between the end of the sample collection period and when we actually have the data in our hands, um, which is pretty good, I think. There, there's not much we can do to really reduce that down too much. Syndromic surveillance, um, rather different, of course. This is typically something that is hospital or healthcare related. What specifically it is uh, can vary quite widely. In Utah, we're specifically talking about emergency department visit related data, so just emergency departments. Um, these data are already being collected typically for, at the very least, the hospital or healthcare facilities own purposes for their own internal reporting purposes, billing purposes, that sort of thing. Um, and you can make use of quite a different variety of, of data that comes out of those facilities. Um, again, in Utah, we're specifically talking about uh, typically some combination of chief complaint and initial discharge diagnosis data. Um, most of our systems for syndromic surveillance make use of both of those. For COVID specifically, it's the initial discharge diagnosis just because chief complaint. There's too much crossover between influenza and uh, RSV for that to be terribly useful. And in Utah, again, this is what I've experienced with here. Um, there's typically a lag of around three days uh, for most data to enter our system, although it's, uh, some of it does trickle in uh, as time goes on. However, most of the analyses make use of averages over a period, often a week or seven day averages. And so the time between some event occurring and then 
you being able to see that change in these averages is more along the lines of somewhere around a week to a week and a half, thereabouts. And then the maps are just um, on the left, a map of our, our currently sampled wastewater facilities, we have 32, and a map of the emergency departments that are part of their syndromic surveillance system, which is 49, which is all of them, which is great. And then, so I want to advance. There we go. So briefly, strengths and limitations, uh, like all data systems, surveillance systems, they each has their own set of strengths and limitations. Um, I think the takeaway to put that first is that in a lot of situations, these are really complementary systems and that they can be used to strengthen each other. Their one strengths can help overcome another's weaknesses and vice versa. I don't really see much conflict between the two. So with wastewater surveillance, um, and again, th these have really been covered um, very, very well by our wonderful CDC presenters earlier, so I'm going to move pretty quick here. Um, they are very independent of traditional public health data sources, things like access to testing and healthcare seeking behavior. I know Amy mentioned this as a really important point. I completely agree. I, didn't, I think this is something we knew going into this, and it's something that has become more and more important as time has gone by, especially with the changes in uh, individual level testing in recent weeks. It also captures all shedders, including asymptomatic cases. Now, not all people will shed necessarily, but everybody who does, we're going to get data from them, um, which is really important. So it's not dependent on people being symptomatic or their severity of their symptoms. It's also very efficient. Um, we are currently sampling at these 32 facilities statewide twice per week, and that covers about 88% of our state's population. And that's just not something that's feasible with individual level testing. It's just not something that could be done, but we're able to do it sustainably and consistently. And as has also been mentioned, they're inherently pooled samples. And I kind of put this in the middle with a little bit of extra gap, um, just because I think it's, it can be both a, a strength and a limitation depending on what you're trying to do. So if what you want is to get data about a a given community in your sewer shed, your wastewater service area reasonably covers that community, then great, your sample's are already there. You don't, there's nothing else you need to do. That being said, if you want to get more granular, you can't do that with that type of sample. You need to get a different sample, typically from a different sampling point or a different sampling area because you can't unpool it. It's inherently pooled. Um, some of the limitations, uh, there are a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of things we don't know, a lot of very open questions, especially on the research side, I think. Um, and the data can be quite volatile. You can see quite a bit of variability in the data and it's not wholly clear all the time whether these are reflecting actual changes in the community that we might want to know about and pay attention to, or whether it just represents changes in the wastewater stream, changes in temperature, weather, storm events, something like that, that changes our data, but it's not something that is of public health interest. Um, and that could be difficult to deal with. And as, as Zach mentioned, and this is also very, very true, there's a need to establish a certain amount of baseline data so you know what data from edit site looks like and you can start determining what it might mean because each site has enough unique factors that you can't necessarily take inclusions and thresholds and metrics directly from another site and apply them to a new one. A lot of times it's just not going to be valid. And so you need to collect data over enough period of time so that you start having an idea of what you're actually looking at and talking about. It could be quite difficult to aggregate and compare data between sites because of all those differences. Um, and in a lot of situations, best practices haven't really fully emerged yet. I think this is changing over time, thankfully, um, as people get more experience and we try new methods, we start figuring out which ones are working even better, which offer more advantages than other methods. Um, but it's, it's a new area, it's a new science, and so we're still figuring things out. And as also been mentioned, segment use can be an issue, more so in some areas of the country than others. In Utah, a lot of the infrastructure is relatively new. So our septic use is on the lower end. In other areas with older infrastructure, especially on the East Coast or in the Midwest, that can be a significant problem. With syndromic surveillance, it's also independent of testing, which again, extremely, extremely valuable, especially in times like now. Um, the status of individual testing really doesn't bear much influence on the data you get out of this system. And it's also a mature system with really well-established methods. Um, and this is 
very valuable, especially to us on the wastewater side, is we're trying to figure out some of these best practices. And we're hoping to be able to take some of the experiences and methods and lessons learned from syndromic surveillance and apply them to our systems. And it's already very, it's very efficient, very similar in, in many ways to wastewater surveillance, because it, especially because the data are already being collected for the most part. So it's just getting that data and, and getting it into the system and databases where you can make use of it for public health purposes. But typically it doesn't involve collecting any new data. It's just getting the data to where it needs to be. And it's really individual level data still so aggregation is relatively easy. You can do it like you would aggregate most other individual local data. So if you want countywide, statewide, what have you, that's really typically not too much of a problem. And in fact, like most individual level data sources, the greater the geographic scale you aggregate on, typically the cleaner and a little bit easier to deal with the data becomes as well. Very different than from wastewater surveillance in that, in that regard. Um, some limitations, it is, inherently, of course, extremely dependent on things like access to healthcare and healthcare seeking behavior. And these things are not evenly distributed and access and seeking behavior are not equal across all populations, all communities and all groups. And this can be a real problem. And this is a, one that's tough to solve too because it gets down to the, the root of issues with our healthcare system. And it can be very dependent on symptom severity. So these are people who had symptom severe enough or some other issue that was severe enough that they actually presented to an emergency department. Depending on which disease we're talking about, which variant we're talking about, that may not be most of the people. That doesn't mean it can't be useful. Oftentimes the trends will still remain the same, but it's important to keep that distinction in mind. And there's a trade-off between timeliness and accuracy when you're using things like the initial discharge diagnosis. Um, you can wait for more accurate and refined data to come in. But again, you, you've lost that time list. You're often waiting weeks, if not months, to get that more refined data, which is great retrospectively. But when you need to make a decision now, it's not so helpful. So as I mentioned, I really ultimately, I think that these two surveillance systems are very complementary. They help strengthen each other. Um, I don't, thus far, we haven't had any conflicts between the two, and I don't necessarily foresee that in the future. I think if even if the two systems were to show very different things, that's more likely to reflect actual differences in what they're measuring, because they're measuring different points in the progress of an infection between shedding and having severe enough symptoms that you're going to the emergency department. They're measuring different things. I think it's likely to reflect real things that we want to pay attention to and would be of interest and not just artifacts of the type of system we're talking about. But we'll, we'll see as time goes on. And last slide, I wanna talk a little bit about some of this very preliminary, very rough to uh, put it mildly, data we've been working on and, and systems we've been working on integrating these two data sources. Um, so we have an ongoing collaboration, as I mentioned with CDC and with our syndromic surveillance folks here at state to try to find ways, commonalities, ways to bridge some of these gaps and to make use of a lot of the knowledge and, and methods that syndromic surveillance has developed over the years and apply them to our data and coming up with ways that we can combine these data to make them both even stronger. Um, and so this is some work we've been also doing as a side project of that to help develop some readiness metrics for hospitals, so statewide metrics, hence the need to aggregate the data to a statewide level. And it can be quite complicated. Wastewater has an inherent geographic scale. Zach covered this, I think, quite well, where each site is unique enough that it becomes quite difficult to compare and aggregate data between them. So at that community level, it's great. Broader, it, it becomes more difficult. Syndromic, it's, it's, there's a different story. It's a little bit easier there. Um, and that's what I mean by each word best uh, at different aggregation levels. Really, thus far, wastewater level works best, quote unquote, at no aggregation. But a lot of times, aggregation is necessary. So what we have here are two charts. The top one is wastewater data. The bottom one is syndromic surveillance data, so emergency department visit data. The, on the top chart, the blue and orange bar chart are the statewide daily case counts. And then the, or, the red line are the number of sites with levels above a certain quantile threshold. So this is very much like those heat maps that Zach was showing. This is back, in fact, based on the same methods where I got, I got the idea and just taking all the data from a site, dividing it into essentially straight quintile uh, met thresholds, bins, and then finding which ones are at that 60% plus bin, 
and counting the number of sites per day. And it actually worked surprisingly well as an indicator and even predictor of when we were going to see these surges in COVID cases, um, as you can see. And in the bottom chart, these are roughly lined up on the time scale on the x-axis, by the way, is the uh, syndromic surveillance data over a similar time frame. Uh, showing the percent of emergency department visits with thresholds at uh, blue being less than 4% or relatively low from one definition of uh, cases due to or severe cases due to COVID. Uh, that yellow is between 4 to 6%, so sort of a middle ground. And then the orangish, pinkish, reddish is greater than 6% or high community levels there. And you can see very similar things. So they can both work really well as indicators or predictors of changes in what, we're, what we would see in individual level cases, um, even when we wouldn't have the data like now, potentially. Um, and I think they can work really well in tandem too and provide more strength because if there's great value in having multiple independent data sources. And if they're both showing you the same thing, that's, I think, much stronger evidence and much stronger rationale for taking public health action than, it, than just relying on a single data source. And that is what I have. I would be happy to take any questions. I think we're going yeah. to hold, hold the okay. questions um, until um, yeah, all of the presenters, because I, I think there's going to be some crossover, and I think the questions then can um, be directed best at that point. Um, but thank you very much. Um, Nathan, that was an excellent presentation. Um, next, um, I'd like to, to introduce Jose Romero and Mike Sima from the Arkansas Department of Health. Bring their slides up. Uh, we don't have any slides. We're, we're, we're going to just present uh, our limited uh, information. Um, so thank, you much. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I'm Jose Romero. I'm the Arkansas Secretary of Health and the Director of the Health Department. I'm also a uh, professor of pediatrics, pediatric infectious disease at the medical center. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, we're, we're, this is really our presentation is more about, uh, uh, I think the adage, uh, uh, bringing coal to Newcastle uh, fits with this presentation because a lot of what we're telling you, you already know. So we are a rural state. Um, uh, our population is about 3 million people. Um, and um, we have uh, uh, three uh, wastewater sites currently functioning. Um, these are in uh, small communities, one of 1,600 people, the other one of 16,000 people. Uh, one of these sites actually has two wastewater sites that are contributing uh, to CDC data. We, uh, we submitted 13 uh, proposals um, and only have uh, uh, those three onboarded at this time. So 10 are not onboarded. So the, the speed with which was talked about, and again, um, was talked about about getting these up, uh, these sites up did not really apply to Arkansas. And let me just also preface it with this. I'm a big proponent of wastewater um, uh, surveillance. Um, and, and, uh, and I think it has a utility in a number of diseases, not just what we're talking about, which is COVID, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So my comments are not to detract from that. They're simply to bring to light certain issues that we view here as a rural state. So um, uh, it's important to note that for our systems, our wastewater systems, many of these are very old um, and they're open systems. They're not closed systems and they are diluted by rainwater or runoff uh, during certain times of the year. Um, and that is a, a going to be an issue that I think we will encounter as you begin to move into rural states and, and states that do not have these uh, well-defined municipal uh, water treatment systems. It's also important to keep in mind that um, about 1.1 million of our population, so about one third of our population uh, is not linked to a municipal wastewater uh, site. Uh, they have septic tanks um, and uh, they would not be captured uh, in a surveillance system. Now, th the argument could be made that, well, some of those individuals will be working in town, for example, and therefore you'll catch you know, their, 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 their refuse uh, that way. But, but, but bear that in mind. Also note that in my state, that is in Arkansas, um, the, the site that has, or the region of the state that has the lowest number of uh, these wastewater uh, treatment facilities uh, and, and the highest number of, um, of, uh, of uh, these um, uh, home sites, um, septic tanks, um, is located in the southwest corner of the state. That is, uh, uh, sorry, the southeast corner of the state, the Delta. And that is the poorest uh, portion of our state. 
And therefore, as you, you've already talked about this issue of, of disparity and, and, and equity um, in, in surveillance. Um, so that group of individuals may be disenfranchised by focusing on these large wastewater sy systems for surveillance. And, we, and I bring that to your attention only. Um, we also view other things such as cost. So the cost to get this started um, is significant. Now, we invested significant amounts of money for nucleic acid amplification testing for COVID. And we can do genomic sequencing now within our system. That's our public health lab. And we agree fully that the public health lab should be the, the lab to, 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 to perform these uh, in, in, in the state. Um, but there will be an outlay for concentrating the specimen for, for, for nucleic acid uh, extraction from these, from, these, uh, from these samples. Further, COVID has really taxed our public health lab. Um, we are limited in space. We had to expand dramatically in order to put into place systems to, make di to diagnose uh, uh, COVID rapidly within our state. And so our health department lab uh, literally has no space where to put these, this, this, this project. Now, we're lucky. Um, we've thought of a way of doing this, and, and we're going to employ a modular system that we currently have on site. So um, we, we, we think we can get this started, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And lastly, the issue of distrust may be very significant. So it, in states like mine, there is a significant distrust and loss of, loss of confidence uh, with the public health system, and in particular with the CDC something that I hear continuously from our legislators. And the legislators have taken an active role in, 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 the, um, in the regulation of public health in our state. Um, you know, we have, we have mass mandates uh, or, or uh, really against mass, mass use, uh, against use of vaccines. So in some states, it, if there is a perceived um, issue with uh, security of, of personal data, from this, uh, you could see, uh, at least in my opinion, um, uh, a movement from the legislators to limit the ability of this use of this data. That being said, I think that this has a, a, a great future. Um, and let me let me give you two examples that I think are very important. Firstly, an act, a, a, a problem that we now have in the United States. We have resurgence of tuberculosis. Um, we have had an, uh, a cluster of TB uh, arising from arising from the COVID pandemic, where they were not seeking care. Um, and that cluster was significant. Um, if we were able to surveil wastewater um, and find these genomes in the wastewater, uh, we could implement a contact tracing or active surveillance for TB in those sites. Another area that I think uh, is going to be very important is in poliovirus surveillance. I'm, I'm the chair of the National Certification Committee for, uh, for polio eradication, uh, we report to the to PAHO, who in turn reports to the World Health Organization. Um, as you know, or you may know, uh, there have been now uh, outbreaks of wild type polio in Malawi and circulating polio virus um, in uh, other countries. So this is a threat to the US um, and it, we do not have a, an active surveillance system for this at this time. All this to say that I think that uh, there is a great future for this. We just need to figure out how to roll it out. And I will turn this over to Mike Sima for his, for his comments. Mike, I think you're muted. Sorry. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. I have no idea what happened between this morning and today, but I will keep my comments very brief. I, I, I do want to thank uh, you all for the opportunity to participate in today. Uh, I think first and foremost, um, you know, I've learned more today about the national uh, wastewater surveillance efforts than I have in the past year or two combined, which you know, I, I appreciate, but it's simultaneously a, a little bit concerning. Um, you know, it's clear that there's much more information out there uh, that just simply hasn't diffused down to states like ours. Uh, and I think uh, that, that we're missing an opportunity to uh, use a powerful public health tool. Uh, and I think if, you know, wastewater is going to be uh, a successful endeavor at a national level, uh, that the, the connection with rural states, localities like uh, that in Arkansas needs to be much stronger. And there's obvious 
avenues for those types of connections, namely through ELC, which we are going to be participating in. But uh, it does seem that we have, you know, you know, we're, we're jumping in at square one, whereas others may have had, uh, you know, early opportunities to be uh, early adopters. And, and I, like most of my colleagues, like to have the opportunity to be pioneers in, in the public health practice and science arenas. Um, other than that, I thought Zach did a great job uh, clearing up a lot of uh, questions that I personally had about the data analysis component. And, and you know, I don't want to be too repetitive, uh, but it seems that it is clear uh, that a more standard approach uh, to trend classification in particular is needed. Uh, you know, percent change in relative levels are moderately useful uh, metrics, but it has been pointed out uh, numerous times already. Percent change is flawed that it can be unclear what the actual practical importance of fluctu uh, fluctuations are without more uh, context. And even for the relative levels, which I believe is, is a relatively new uh, metric to make its way onto the uh, COVID data tracker, uh, it's not clear to me what impact, if any, uh, that, you know, historical levels after a monster wave like Omicron are going to have on that particular um, measure for sites that have been, you know, uh, monitoring voice bars, SARS CoV-2 for extended periods of time. It seems that if we're relating things back to, you know, Omicron levels, that we're going to miss early fluctuations and in, in, in levels at those particular sites. And then, you know, obviously, you know, further downstream, uh, the, the, the considerations that are required for you know, state and health departments, local health departments to integrate wastewater surveillance into their actual public health response and, and actually operationalize this information that we are getting from this novel tool uh, so that we're acting appropriately. Uh, you know, it's, it's clear that wastewater surveillance is going to give us an opportunity to detect aberrations much, much quicker than, you know, what we have previously done uh, in order to, you know, fully make or to make, you know, uh, full use of that utility uh, you know, really having a concerted effort early on as we onboard further targets for wastewater surveillance to give consideration to what an appropriate response is uh, uh, for fluctuations in wastewater levels for particular targets. So uh, that's something that we will be considering as we uh, initiate and expand wastewater surveillance uh, here in Arkansas. And that's all I really wanted to add to the conversation today. Thank you, Jose and, and Mike. Thank, thank both of you. Um, Next, we're going to hear from uh, Anna Merotra from the Water Environment uh, Federation for perspectives about small and mid-sized utilities in implementing and expanding wastewater surveillance uh, systems. Great, thank you all. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be with you all today, and I wanted to talk to you really about two ideas. Like, I guess I've got to figure out how to forward the slides. Okay. Um, two topics um, that I wanted to cover with you today. Uh, some definitions and numbers related to small and mid-sized utilities. And then I wanna offer up three considerations related to engaging these utilities in ongoing wastewater surveillance programs. And I'm calling these considerations the three Ps, permit, people, and point. Um, one of the big takeaway messages I hope you um, come away with is that there are many and many different types of small and mid-sized utilities in the U.S. And one way I want to convey this is by showing you a series of Google Earth images for uh, smaller facilities that are currently engaged in or have been engaged in wastewater surveillance programs. So this is your first example on the screen here, a conventional activated sludge plant from upstate New York. Okay, so let's start with definitions. How do we define the size of a wastewater system or a utility? So this is typically done either on uh, a population basis or a flow basis. And this flow can either be permitted capacity or it could be the actual flow, usually represented as the average daily flow, which is the average volume of water that that wastewater facility treats during the course of a 24 hour period. Um, so EPA defines a small wastewater system as one that serves less than or equal to 10,000 people and has an ADF of less than 1 million gallons per day or less than one MGD. And I'm essentially gonna use the same definition, but there is no definition for mid-size. And so I'm gonna go ahead and invent one today for our purposes and say that a mid-size or medium wastewater system is one that has a permitted flow capacity of more than one MGD. So it's not small, but it's um, the capacity is less than or equal to 10 MGD. 
And you'll note that I'm using the terms wastewater system and wastewater utility sort of synonymously. And that's okay for small and mid-sized utilities where there's typically one wastewater treatment plant, one wastewater system for that utility that kind of falls apart when you get to larger utilities that will have multiple wastewater systems under their umbrella. It's worth noting, of course, that permitted flow and ADF are not the same thing, but they're closer than they are not close. Um, you know, a, a plant that's permitted for a million gallons per day is not going to be reporting an ADF of a billion gallons per day. It's um, also true that ADF is proportional to the population served, but things like climate, water use, um, the age of the collection system, those things really complicate that relationship more than you think. Okay, so let's talk numbers. So um, based on WEF data um, that we take from permit information available from a variety of sources, we think that there are about 15,400 permitted water resource recovery facilities or WERFs uh, in the US. These are wastewater systems that largely treat um, municipal sanitary flows, sewage, but also can treat other flows, you know, industrial, um, industrial flows and the like. Of these, um, these facilities, we have permitted flow capacity information for about 12,500. We also have ADF information for some of these, but it's about half as many um, as that, as that 12,000 number. And here I'm showing you another example, of uh, this time a mid-sized facility that's um, all bundled up inside buildings uh, in Alaska. Okay, so let's dive deeper into the numbers. If we divide up that 12,500 or so worths, 12,442 to be exact, for which we have permitted flow capacity data into five bins. So there are five colors on this pie chart and I'm using extra large um, to uh, correspond to plants that have capacities greater than 100 MGD. Large is something that's more than 10, but less than or equal to 100. Medium, I already defined, um, one to less than or equal to 10. And then small is anything less than or equal to one MGD. Again, this is permitted flow capacity. And I actually further divided small into an extra small category. So each you know, piece of pie over here just corresponds to the number of these facilities that fall into that bin. And what you can see is that the small and the extra small, you know, account for the, the majority of the number of wharfs in our, in our country. It's a different story, of course, if you count up um, total permitted flow in, for each of these bins. So on the right-hand side now, I'm showing total permitted flow is, 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 uh, relates to the size of the pie piece instead of total number of facilities. And in this case, you can see that the large um, and the extra large account for most of the permitted flow. In other words, uh, well less than half a percent of all wharfs represent about a third of the total permitted flow capacity in this country, but more than 90% of the wharfs. So that's all those that fall into the extra small, small and medium categories represent about a quarter of the permitted flow. And we could extend this analysis to population served instead of permitted flow, but you get the idea. Um, uh, there are a lot of small and mid-sized facilities in the U.S. And I should note that around 7,000 of these extra small, small and medium facilities are lagoon systems. And I'm showing an example here on the right from North Dakota. Uh, and also behind me too. All right, so um, that brings me to the three considerations that I wanna offer up when thinking about sustainable participation by small and mid-sized utilities. So the three Ps. And the first is that meeting its permit requirements is any WERF's primary mission. The second is that having enough people at the WERF is a prerequisite to wastewater surveillance program participation. And the third is that being able to see the point of participating is a necessary condition for sustained program participation. So I'm gonna go into each of these a little bit more, um, but here's another small utility that's currently participating in a wastewater surveillance program uh, in Massachusetts. Okay, so let's talk about permits first. And by permits, I mean National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or NPDES or NIPDES permits. And it, when it comes to permits, it's important to keep in mind that permits are largely written, whether they're written by EPA or by a delegated state agency around effluent requirements. So this is an, an excerpt of a draft per 
permit. This is just an example from a facility in New York. And you can see that this facility um, has affluent limitations related to, um, for example, total suspended solids. You know, they need, need to achieve 30 milligrams per liter and um, 87.57 pounds per day of TSS on an aver average monthly basis. Again, that's based on the affluent. And they need to demonstrate compliance with this limit by collecting composite samples of that effluent uh, once every two weeks. Um, and so this is all about the effluent. Wastewater surveillance, of course, focuses on the influent and ideally more frequent sample collection than twice per month. And most of the time permits, oops, are not written um, to directly address influent sampling requirements. So um, it is, all permits um, are based on meeting the, the um, requirements in 40 CFR port, part 133. This is the secondary treatment regulation, which requires, there are some ex exceptions to this, but which requires that a facility achieve secondary treatment, which is defined as 85% BOD and TSS removal across the facility. So to calculate that, you need to know what's coming in as well as what's going out. However, influence sampling type and frequency are not necessarily specified in the permit. There are exceptions, however. Some states do include influence sampling requirements on their permits. Iowa is one example, Kentucky is another example, and here's just a snapshot from an Iowa uh, NIPTES permit showing that there is monitoring specifically required in the influent. This is all just, this, just to give you an idea and that a WERF needs to sample for permit compliance first and wastewater surveillance or some other goal second. And the permit sampling routine may not be compatible with the needs for wastewater surveillance sampling, especially at smaller facilities where permits re require you know, less frequent sampling. Okay, so the second P is people. And it, it goes without saying, right, that people are needed to collect samples at WERFs. And, and at smaller facilities, these people are often certified operators because a small facility might not have laboratory staff. Um, and the laboratory staff might be doing the collection at larger utilities. So um, good data on the total number of licensed wastewater operators are hard to come by. One estimate is 20,000, which would work out to be a little bit more than one operator per WERF. We know that there are some uh, WERFs that have many more than one operator, um, and there are some that are staffed by one part-time operator. Um, and this may be especially, and, and that part-time operator may be remote, or it may be a full-time operator that's remote. This is especially the case at the, um, the thousands of lagoon systems that I mentioned in the US. Um, although it was not the case at this lagoon system I'm showing here, this is one from Wyoming that participated in the state run surveillance program through the end of the year and is actually staffed by three operators. It's quite a large system. You know, it's notable that insufficient staffing or resources, but mostly staffing, was the third most common reason cited by WERFs for not participating in the first of the phase three commercial testing contracts. Okay, so staying on the topic of people, um, having what I call a wastewater surveillance champion can make all the difference. And I've been really lucky to be able to, um, sorry about that. Um, I've been really lucky to be able to talk to many of these champions, you know, Philip from Wyoming, Carrie from Alaska, um, Crystal from Oregon. These and many, many other wastewater utility staff are people who feel that supporting wastewater surveillance programs is the right thing to do. Um, but it's critical to view WERFs as valued partners in, this pro in these programs and, you know, not make the assumptions that the Phillips and the Carries and the Crystals will always be there to, to support wastewater surveillance efforts. And this is where incentives can help. And when I, when I mean, what I mean by incentives, it, it can be many things. It could be paying stipends and bonuses, um, providing courier services, uh, supporting operator training or licensing requirements, reimbursing the purchase of auto samplers or flow meters, uh, helping map sewer sheds. And we have a lot of work to do in terms of figuring out which incentives are most highly valued by WERFs and how best to implement incentive programs. But you know, making a clear and material demonstration that utilities are valued partners in wastewater surveillance programs is absolutely imperative. 
Um, and finally, uh, along the lines of demonstrating that utilities are valued partners, um, you know, all utilities, really all of us, frankly, right, want to see the point of what we're doing. We want to understand uh, how this technology will be valuable beyond COVID. And I would say that utilities really do want to be, they want to see the data. They want to see the data in a timely manner, their wastewater data. You know, they, want, they want to get the data right from the lab, and they don't necessarily want it to go through a health department partner. Um, so with that, I'll um, turn it back over and uh, look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, our last speaker is Lance Gable from Wayne State University, who will speak to the ethical and legal considerations for wastewater-based disease surveillance. And after his presentation, we'll have time for, for questions. Well, thank you, everybody. It's a really great pleasure to be here as part of this committee today to, to get to, uh, to speak with all of you and to, uh, to share some ideas. Um, I, I want to acknowledge at the outset um, two colleagues who've worked with me on a lot of the developing of these ideas. Um, Jeffrey Ram here at Wayne State University uh, in the medical school, uh, who, who's an expert in, in wastewater surveillance, and uh, Natalie Ram, a professor at uh, the University of Maryland's law school, um, who's an expert in privacy law. And, and we, we've been working on these issues since early in the pandemic. Um, initially, um, uh, along with some of my colleagues, we were looking at doing some wastewater screening um, on the campus in the very earliest parts of the pandemic before uh, the national programs and the broader initiatives had started. And we began to think about a lot of the legal and ethical issues that were um, inherent to this kind of work. Um, and started to develop some ideas around that. And then later on, uh, now we're currently participating uh, with NWSS and with the, the, the state and local um, health departments here in Michigan to, to actually participate in the, in the surveillance um, projects uh, that are ongoing here in Detroit. Um, I think, uh, you know, since so many of, actually, let me make sure I can, oh, there we go, I've got it moving. Um, so, so obviously the, the, the incredibly rapid expansion of these systems uh, pre presents some really important opportunities for public health um, and um, creates the, the kind of capacity uh, that that would previously have not been uh, really, I think, conceivable had it not been for, for this great investment of resources. And I think um, when you have a significant expansion of a new system like this uh, for, for a public health purpose, um, you know, it creates th these great opportunities, but it also creates um, the need to think really carefully about what the downstream uses and and potential future uses of these systems could be, uh, both for the good and both and and also for thinking about how they could be uh, potentially um, used in ways that could raise uh, ethical concerns and 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 could could invoke uh, some some legal concerns as well. And so I I think where we start is if we're looking at you know and, and I'm not going to go through the the. The, in detail, uh, some of the potential uses of this of the information gathered through these systems, because I think that's been covered really well by some of the other speakers today. But I think some of the proposed uses for wastewater surveillance are fairly straightforward, you know, public health surveillance uh, techniques that, and they fit clearly within the well-established rubric of public health surveillance that is easily supportable under existing law, is easily supported under existing ethical um, analyses of, of public health. Um, you know, the, using this information, again, um, uh, now that we, we've gathered enough information to know that there, there is some credible scientific basis for linking uh, SARS-CoV-2 detection to the potential for future spikes in, 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 uh, in COVID cases in the communities where the detection occurs, you know, that kind of, you know, public health opportunity to, to add this, this technique to the, to the toolkit of, of, of screening for disease um, and, and ser serving as an early warning sign, complementing other surveillance efforts that are ongoing uh, is really very promising in lots of ways. But, but I think, you know, some of the other proposed uses, especially when we talk about um, using some of these data in a more targeted, more granular way, um, there, I think, uh, you know, we need to think carefully about um, how that information is used once it's collected. In particular, it can be used in a very for very positive public health initiatives, like targeting resources towards communities that are at greater risk and, and to, to really direct resources rapidly to those communities when outbreaks occur. Uh, on the other hand, um, sometimes, you know, collecting this data at that more granular, granular level can 
um, be more likely to implicate privacy concerns and uh, the potential for um, discrimination or stigma against people in communities that um, that 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 end up testing positive for new outbreaks. And so, and 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 especially as we move beyond the the COVID focus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 focus of these screening systems, we need to keep those kinds of of potential concerns, especially foremost in our minds. I, I also think that um, uh, you know, th this, this list of uses is, is certainly not comprehensive. And there are a lot of things that we've already even talked about today that go beyond this list that also have different kinds of implications. And so you know, using data collected through wastewater screening for targeting resources um, can be a, a role public health positive. Um, but if if that's the only tool that's being used, or it's one of the primary tools that's being used to, to target resources, and you're not um, uh, targeting resources towards other areas that might not fall within these systems and might might be invisible to these systems, uh, that's something that needs to be um, kept in mind as 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 we go forward. Now, um, I wanted to uh, earlier on um, uh, during during Rachel West's presentation, uh, she identified um, a number of uh, ethical considerations and and I want to kind of build on some of what she was saying earlier on um, you know the, the, the there's there is some really good work out there that started to look at some of these issues um, in detail the the WHO uh, public health surveillance ethical guidelines are, are really useful I think as as are the the, the guidelines uh, developed by the Canadian water network um, and I, I think we can focus on, Kind of a couple of very broad types of ethical considerations in thinking about conducting wastewater surveillance. Um, among the considerations, um, one, one is the focus on the common good. And so, um, when surveillance systems, public health surveillance systems are being developed, um, we want the systems to be developed with the goal of trying to advance a clear and legitimate public health purpose and uh, making sure that the analysis, use, and dissemination of data collected through these systems. Um, corresponds to that uh, that public health purpose. Um, one one thing that I think is you know one potential risk of uh, the 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 existence of these systems in the longer term, you know that they have a great potential to be used for lots of different types of things. Um, and you know keeping the focus on that the, those public health common good purposes where where this data can be utilized and making sure that there's not a mission creep over time where, you know, people realize these systems are available and want to use them for other purposes that are not necessarily uh, going towards uh, uh, trying to improve public health. Um, and we also need to, of course, make sure that the, the data being collected and being used in justifying these public health interventions uh, are valid data and of high quality and, and, and advancing those goals. Um, on, on the point of ensuring equity, uh, this is essentially important. So um, uh, it, it, in a just society, we need to take steps to allow everyone to flourish, even in the face of, of social inequity and disparate access to resources. And this goes to some of the points uh, that I referred to earlier. So if we want a justice-oriented, equity-oriented wastewater surveillance system, uh, we wanna make sure that the, the system is not being used in ways that imposes additional unnecessary burdens on populations uh, that are more vulnerable and take steps to reduce these burdens that already exist. And so th you know, this could, this could include in some circumstances um, refraining from the release of data that generates discrimination or stigma towards people in a particular community, especially if it's targeted toward a particular community. Um, but on the other hand, it could mean that it, it's an imperative to release data so that people have access to information that they need to take uh, to, to allow them to protect themselves against risks that are that are currently emerging in their communities. Um, the, the data can be used to um, to bring resources to, to areas that need them uh, by targeting uh, areas that are most at risk. But equity can also be undermined if the systems uh, instead result in disproportionate application of restrictive measures against those communities compared with non surveilled communities. And so th 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 these, these are co a complicated set of considerations, but uh, these need to be part of the, the process in analyzing how data should be used. And um, just to give one example, um, you know, focusing surveillance for COVID, for, for SARS-CoV-2 on university campuses might have the effect of concentrating resources on a population that might be less vulnerable um, to COVID-19 and reducing equity allocation of resources to other communities that might not receive that attention. Um, and similarly, excluding systems that are not connected to sewers or municipal systems could also lead to that same type of result. Um, respect for persons is a, is a core ethical consideration as well. Uh, it's important to remember that, uh, or to, to, to make sure 
that public health surveillance um, is being done in a way that keeps in mind the effect of, of these systems and the information gathered on individuals. Um, and if, you know, that, that I'm going to talk in a few minutes about privacy considerations, but there could be implications for privacy, autonomy, bodily integrity, individual rights, et cetera, depending on how information is used. And so if, if detection of a positive wastewater signal for a disease outbreak occurs, um, the, the, there has to be some consideration of what that information is used for. If it's used to target resources, that's a positive public health benefit. If it's used to, to immediately impose serious restrictions on a targeted area, that might be public might be supported by the public health goal, but it might not be. And so uh, thinking carefully about how information is used to downstream justify certain kinds of interventions is part of this, this calculation. And then as if the sampling areas become smaller and smaller, more granular data being collected, and uh, if genetic sequencing and other techniques are being used that I can identify individuals, that also raises some concern about uh, privacy violations as well. Uh, and, then, and then finally here, um, enabling good governance, um, having transparency, developing trust among communities um, is an important aspect of thinking about how these systems are going to operate. And so this includes um, having good safety protocols, um, data sharing and retention policies, uses uh, uh, policies about use of data to spur other kinds of public health measures um, and a, a lot of other issues as well. And so, um, but also obtaining community assent and community understanding is really important to ensuring that in the long term communities will, will support these initiatives and be on board for um, the consequences that come from gathering data through these systems. Um, uh, one, of, one of the points that, that Jose Romero made in his comments a few minutes ago, I think was really um, uh, especially important that you, you may have, uh, and, and this kind of goes to the, the, the last slide I have here that I want to show, which is, um, if we're thinking about legal implications, you know, who has the authority to, to conduct surveillance? Generally, public health surveillance authority is fairly broad. State and local governments have a broad degree of, of police power authority to engage in these kinds of activities. But if there's a loss of community trust or a loss of trust among leaders who see these systems as um, invasive or problematic. The, that could lead to efforts to try to, to undermine the authority to conduct these kinds of uh, surveillance efforts. Um, also need to pay attention to the, the scope of surveillance, um, making sure that it's focused on public health purposes and the, and the data being collected are not being used for um, additional non-public health purposes that could that could also uh, give rise to legal challenge and could give rise to re really problematic mission creep. Um, one example here, of course, is that if data is being used um, for to to, uh, for example, to target people uh, through law enforcement, um, I, I know infectious disease surveillance is unlikely to lead to this kind of use, but if we're talking about screening for drug use and screening for other kinds of substances in wastewater, it could give rise to a lot of other potentially problematic uses. And there, there is some legal precedent that would limit law enforcement being able to use these kinds of systems, uh, you know, Fourth Amendment protections that require um, uh, a, a, you know, the, the, the court to, to get a warrant and probable cause to conduct a search. Um, however, um, the, 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 this is something that we need to keep an eye on again as the, the system is grows and expands. We can also imagine other kinds of entities wanting to get this information for non-public health purposes. You know, life insurers might be really interested to know the communities where there's a higher incidence of metabolic factors in the wastewater associated with chronic diseases. And so um, thinking about not only what we're planning to use this system for now, but what some of the long-term implications can be. And so I, I know I'm running out of time, and I'm just going to sum up by saying um, that you know, th th this, these systems present such an important opportunity to expand public health surveillance in a way that can really benefit our communities in some substantial ways. And um, But as we're developing these systems, we need to keep these legal and ethical considerations in mind, these and many others, and um, ensure that as these systems evolve, they're being developed in a way that, that takes these factors into account. And, and maintains public trust. Thank you. Thank you, Lance, and 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 thank all of the speakers. Those, those were really fantastic presentations. Um, and I'm sure our committee is going to have more questions than there is time for, but that's okay. We're just uh, let's go ahead and get started on our questions. Krista is the first hand I see. 
thank you speakers. Those are, those are great talks. I have a question for, for Anna. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, it, uh, the, the plants that I've worked with, I know that some plants are able, I've talked, this is about your, your comments on incentives. I know that some plants um, are able to, you know, be reimbursed or maybe to, we, you can help fund staffing um, to, to, to cover the work. And then others um, uh, are, are not able to take um, funding to, to uh, contribute to that. I was wondering if you could speak to this and if you see this as possibly a hindrance to getting plants to participate. Um, yeah, great, great question. Thanks, thanks for asking that. And you're absolutely right. There isn't, I don't think, any one incentive that will um, work in every single jurisdiction. Um, and right, I think about Wyoming and Missouri as being able to um, make stipend payments to the participating utilities, but maybe not New York, for example. So it's going to really depend on what's possible locally. I don't think the lack of you know, cash incentives will hinder participation among um, wastewater utilities. I think there's plenty of other ways to support their participation. And again, I'm really speaking to utilities where it is, um, there's more effort involved in collecting the necessary influence samples because they might not already have an auto sampler set up or they might not already have staff on site. So um, I think there's a universe out there of incentives that, that we can talk about. Um, does that does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Michelle. Thank you everyone for being with us. Um, I've heard of, uh, from a couple of speakers already today that there's a strong preference for having the state's public health lab do the testing. And particularly given capacity constraints, I was hoping that Dr. Romero or someone could just uh, Take me through why that is so important as opposed to building more capacity in the or using existing capacity in the commercial sector. Yeah, I, so I'll, I'll give you the, the view from Arkansas, and that is that, yeah, I, you know, we've we've talked to our governor about this and, and um, I was expecting a hard sell um, and he rapidly embraced this um, and is willing to fund us as, as we go forward to set this up, but but he wants to have that data within our system and to have it rapidly available. Um, and the concern has been that we're not gonna be able to get that data as fast as we want. Uh, and that's why uh, it's within our system for, for, all, of these, for all of these issues. And, and then we can, you know, if we decide that, as I mentioned, we could use this for TB, for um, polio, for other diseases, we can rapidly use them the system that we have, over. All right, uh, Chuck. Yep. Uh, Dr. Romero, another question for you. I, the, the unsewered population has been on my mind for quite a while, and I, I'm intrigued by the fact that at least in Arkansas, you said there's a strong correlation between unsewered prevalence and your uh, more disadvantaged populations. And I wonder um, if that also correlates with any hot spots for COVID that you've observed and whether or not we know more generally nationally, whether there's a greater or lesser prevalence in co of COVID in unsewered populations. So to the, la to the last question, no, I don't know if there is a greater, uh, greater uh, incidence of COVID, um, but we do know that, that this area is, is very rural. And so we saw a lot of cases in that area, they, they, you know, they, they have a lot of the characteristics that have already been described. That is, yep. they're, they're reluctant to, for uptake and of, of the vaccine, reluctant for, for testing, uh, sort of feel that they're, that they're not at risk because they're in a rural area. So we, we do see a, a larger number of, of cases there. And I don't know if, if Dr. Simo wants to make any specific comment about that because he has his finger more on the data. No, I, Dr. Mayor, I think you hit the nail right on the head there. Thank you. All right, Rekha. Um, great presentations, everybody. And uh, my, I have a couple of questions, but let me start with uh, Nathan uh, from Utah. I have a quick question. Um, I really uh, liked your turnaround time. It's very impressive, three days. 
So I was wondering, are you um, sampling twice a week or just once a week? If you are doing twice a week, how do you manage those logistic issues? Uh, in Virginia, we are planning to go for twice a week sampling in our phase two, but we are working with our public health lab uh, on streamlining how we will be, be how we will manage uh, handling these samples and still giving that uh, uh, impressive turnaround time like within a couple of days sure and um, you know I agree logistical issues are really one of the more complicated things that are, are constant to deal with um, when we made the switch from our previous academic partner labs to consolidating at our state public health lab back last August, that was a huge issue and it took months to resolve everything. We do sample twice per week. Um, and one of the big things was A, having a good and reliable courier service. That's how we're getting the samples from the facilities to the lab for testing. Um, and they've been doing great. Another thing was finding a schedule where all of the facilities could sample on the same days. So we're able to basically batch samples and the lab waits until all of the samples come in for a particular sampling set on a given day before they run the analyses. And they typically all come in mostly on the same day. There's a few from uh, the most remote Southwest corner of Utah that requires two courier services. And so it comes in early the next morning and then the lab does that. So there's kind of a day, one of those uh, three days is for transport. And then it's the next two days are for the lab processes. So it's really just finding every little way you can to increase efficiency and to reduce that time. And eventually they hopefully add up and then you, you're able to get it down. But it's not a simple thing whatsoever. And it's a constant struggle and finding those days where all the facilities could sample and at least on the same day was quite complicated. It was a lot of back and forth with the courier, with the lab, with the facilities, try a different day, et cetera. Thank you. Um, so I have a follow-up question. Uh, like you just mentioned you are doing uh, twice a week sampling. So uh, say, uh, are you doing this uh, composite samples? Uh, if you are doing that, then maybe you are using two days to get those samples, right? Like you set up the auto sampler and then for 24 hours, and then do you, you know, freeze that sample and ship those together or like, uh, you know, just, shipping those samples as you get it, because we are just designing our strategy. So that's why I'm trying to learn. Sure, absolutely. Most of our facilities do con collect 24 hour composite samples. There are essentially three sites that don't just because they don't have the capacity to, and they don't want an auto sampler to change it. I, I suspect they're smaller sites. I suspect it's very much um, gets into what Anna was talking about where they have their type of samples that they have to take for the permitting purposes, which is what we currently get. Um, in theory, they could collect composite samples, but that would be an entirely new thing and they just don't have the capacity or bandwidth to take that on. But most of them are doing 24 hour composites. So you're correct that sampling will start 24 hours previous, um, for example, on a Monday morning, will end Tuesday morning, the courier will come by on Tuesday, pick up the sample, take it to the lab. They're not frozen, they're shipped on, they're kept refrigerated after collection, um, and then sh shipped via courier on a, in a cooler with ice packs to the lab where they're again stored under refrigerator. Freeze line, um, we're reluctant to do that because it can have a negative effect on RNA, basically. Thank you, that was helpful. Uh, I have one more question for you. Uh, are you using syndromic surveillance and wastewater surveillance for COVID or some other diseases also as of now? Just for COVID right now, and it's very early days, we're still figuring out um, some of the really basic issues around combining data sets, integrating different methods, figuring out how best, like is one reliable, more reliable in certain situations than the other one, vice versa. We're still figuring a lot of that out, but for right now, we're definitely still focused on COVID. That's all we're testing for currently in wastewater, but we very much want to expand in the next year to other pathogen targets where, and so neuronic surveillance will be very useful in that same thing. We'll hopefully be able to use a lot of the methods we've developed for COVID to that, because of course that data should be collected via and available via syndromic surveillance as well. Thank you. Michelle. 
My question is also for Dr. LaCrosse. You mentioned that not everybody sheds virus. Could you help me understand that and what you think we need to know about the implications of that? Absolutely. Um, with the caveat that folks from CDC are probably going to be more well-versed than I. So I would defer to knowledge from them as opposed to myself. But my understanding is that first off, there's a real dearth of basic research around this topic. There's been, you know, maybe a little bit more than a handful of relatively small studies, small sample wise, sorry, uh, sample size wise studies relatively early in the pandemic that actually looked at this sort of thing. And they found a pretty variable range. Um, you know, it's, I, I don't remember the percentages off the top of my head, maybe in the 50 to 60 to 70% of people infected with COVID were found to actually be shedding the virus via their GI system. So it's not everybody. Um, I don't have any knowledge, and I'm not sure that anybody's looked, but again, defer to CDC here, on if we know anything about what might affect that. Like, are certain populations or age groups or comorbid conditions or what have you, does that certain things, factors, make somebody more likely to shed or less likely to shed? Similarly, we have essentially no information on how different variants affect shedding rate. We know how, we have some information on how they might affect viral load, and I have in my opinion, pretty strong anecdotal evidence that it has a pretty strong effect on shedding rate, which would make perfect biological sense. But we just don't have any data on that. Similarly, how does vaccination affect shedding rate? We don't really know. So there's there's a lot of basic research that would be really helpful to have. And it's it's one of those things where despite that lack, it's still an incredibly useful system. And I think as we get this information in, it'll become even more useful. Lauren. So um, I'm, I'm going to ask Dr. LaCrosse um, a question too. Um, so in terms of using, um, I, I think just for the benefit of, of us here, um, in terms of using um, wastewater surveillance, viral load, talking about increases, um, and um, it, it, it's, you know, the, the, the tie together with actual health data, which may be waning in terms of testing and things like that, um, seems really, really important, right? Because we don't always know if we see something in the wastewater, whether it's really going to have an effect in the community in terms of illness. Um, and so, you know, it's really promising that you're bringing in this syndromic surveillance data. Um, I, I was wondering what um, the syndromic surveillance, like, I've also looked into that a little bit. What are your thoughts about, I mean, we've seen relationships with um, actually call center testing volumes it was an indicator of people looking for where they could get tests. That was a precursor um, that came really very closely with the wastewater. And then, and then we saw um, not, I mean, the, the same data you're using, the essence data, the, um, the COVID discharge diagnosis, but the proportion out of ILI was a really good indicator. Did you look at that? And also going farther in terms of um, hospital hospital data, ICU bed uses and things like that, do you have access to that? So I'm talking from the Houston standpoint, we have that kind of data, which is great for people that have systems as big as ours, but what kinds of data do other places have is what I'm curious about, like how helpful would that be? Yeah, and those are great questions. That that's that general topic is something that we're is in active discussions in that collaboration I mentioned with CDC and our syndromic surveillance folks. It's not just how can we make use of things in Utah, but how can we build a broader framework that other jurisdictions can make use of as well? Because that's really the the most important thing. Um, and to answer your questions. I would have to talk to our syndromic surveillance expert on what data we have um, in terms of I don't think we've looked at influenza-like illness. This is, you know, COVID-like illness. So there's some pretty broad crossover between the definitions. Um, we do have access to some hospital use data. I'm not super familiar with it. Um, so I would have to investigate the timeliness of it, the completeness of it. Um, but I think it's pretty good in general. So that's certainly a, a could be a valuable area to look into as well. And that's something we'd want to do. Like I said, there's very early days where we're you know, figuring out ways to combine this, um, these types of data, but absolutely combining it with 
other metrics as well, like really whatever is available. You know, one of the classic uh, definitions of syndromic surveillance I learned in grad school was purchases at things like pharmacies. So if people are buying more cold medications, that might be an indication that something, you don't know what exactly what, could even just be allergies theoretically, but there's something happening there that you might want to pay attention to. And being able to link it to things like wastewater data um, and any other data streams could really help sharpen the, the picture of what you're seeing. So I agree completely, but it, it's early days yet. So we don't quite yeah. Yeah, so I know that we don't collect that in the syndromic surveillance now in the essence systems, we no longer collect pharmacy data. So yeah. that is a really good point. I agree with you. Multiple data streams would be helpful here. I have one more question. Go ahead. <laughs> um, actually for uh, our colleague, our, the law professor from Wayne State. I'm sorry, I'm looking for his name. Hello, I'm here. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's Lance. Hi, <laughs> hi sorry. Um, so I, I, I just, uh, I, the kinds of things that you brought up are really important and we have all dealt with them in health departments and, and releasing data. And, and I, 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 uh, I wanted to hear a little bit more about your thoughts about the right to know, um, because I understand stigmatism. We have cancer clusters in Houston and people that live in the cancer clusters, their neighborhoods have, you know, it potentially a stigma. And so um, I know where you're going with that, but at the same time, there are also communities that didn't know that they had a low vaccination rate or they didn't know that they, you know, a zip code level. And that's that when, you know, we had, we also sample at schools, K through 12 schools, and we post that information. Um, and the parents want to know if there's COVID in the school. So, you know, where do you see the line of um, the idea of a social stigma versus parents, public, making their own decisions? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I don't think it's possible to draw a clear line in all situations. I, I, think, I think both of those perspectives that you just outlined are, are important ones. And I think one way to, one way to think about this or to, to develop policies a, a, about this issue uh, is to consult with the community. Um, and so, so that, that's promoting transparency um, ahead of time and saying, you know, we're developing these systems. Here's what, here's the kinds of information we're collecting. Here's what our intention is to do with this information. And, and I, I think if you can get some community input, that might also inform where the appropriate line of disclosure. I, I, I think generally speaking, more disclosure is generally going to be a better strategy than less disclosure. But, but, but I can see that, you know, especially the, it's the way that the information is framed too. If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're releasing information and the, the message is that, you know, this particular community is is a more risky community to live in that could have a lot of negative repercussions, um, but you don't want to withhold that information either. And so I think doing this kind of you know having having conversations within people developing systems, but also with members of the community to figure out where that where those appropriate lines are is is one strategy that I think can be useful. Um, I also think that it that it might it might differ somewhat depending on what kind of information you have, and it also might it might um, dictate what. What, at what level of granularity you release the information as well. If you're talking about very broad, now more granular information might be more useful to people in particular communities to know what's going on in their specific neighborhoods. Um, but but th there's also a higher risk with that more granular information. And so I, I, I feel like I'm talking around your question in a circle, but I think it's because it's a really hard issue to, to resolve. All right, thank you, Lance. Um, is there any other questions? Oh, go ahead, Rebecca. So I have a follow-up question or kind of similar question. Uh, Lauren just uh, asked, um, as a health department partner, we were trying to, we were in a tough spot. Like it's so hard to protect the data. I mean, we are protecting that. We have a good governance, data governance. And we even reached out to each and every utility who are participating with us for their consent before uh, even thinking about releasing our public facing dashboard, which is still like inter uh, it's still an internal dashboard, it's not external, um, but we have consent from all the utilities. And my question is like, it, it's so hard to, you know, find that balance people are curious like I get lots of email from parents and uh, from uh, you know educated uh, citizens and they, they keep asking like 
soon is never soon. Where is your data? You are analyzing throughout the state and uh, that data is uh, still not out. So uh, we need to release data uh, under FOIA Act, Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and uh, we don't give the raw data for those uh, reasons, like even under that, we generally give them a report and a snapshot of the area. Like people generally ask, we are uh, really interested in learning in my community, what is the status of that? And I'm going for a vacation somewhere. So can you tell us uh, how is the COVID trend there? So that fine line is so difficult. So I'm just trying to understand uh, when we will have a, you know, defined framework like what we can do uh, and you know how can we release that data in a more safer way we we don't want uh, you know something uh, like a personal genome project pzp like there was an incident happened so we don't like want something like that to happen so being a like, little more proactive but still need to be uh, you know answerable yeah i mean you you've identified some really important issues there and i, I think that you know, the, the, in terms of FOIA and other requirements to release data, that's going to differ somewhat state to state um, in terms of how, how, how much detail has to be released. And I think a lot of states have been kind of navigating that throughout the pandemic in terms of uh, releasing different kinds of surveillance data. Um, I, I think for the most part, um, the, the things like the, the, re the really detailed raw data do not typically have to be released through, through those FOIA requests, um, although I, I can't say that definitively in every state. Um, I think it's going to it's going to really you know you de definitely need to have uh, you know some legal experts in the state look at that as to as to what what we, what could be compelled to be released. But but I, but I think it just in terms of making decisions about releasing that data, um, I, I I do think because there is such a high level of public interest in that data, um, when it is released, making sure that it's released not just in a in a graph or a table on the on the website, but also with some explanation about what you can what. What, inform, what, the, what the information really means um, can, can also help, I think, um, not only satisfy people's interests, but also to, to make sure that, that it's not misinterpreted or misapplied or, 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 or you, know, it, 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 you, you can frame it in a way that, 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 that hopefully makes it less likely to be, um, uh, to, to lead to, to, to kind of negative inferences or, or any kind of uh, stigmatizing effects. Thank you. All right, Stephanie gets the last question. Hi there. So this question is for either Jose or Mike or Nathan um, or all that I'm interested in hearing your input on kind of how you've used this data to make public health decisions. And if that, you know, if you have examples that you could share about how wastewater surveillance data has been helpful specifically, or if you've had challenges with it, what particularly needs to be addressed to better use that data for public health decision making. If, if this is Jose, I'm sorry. Um, yes, uh, is Mike, Mike, are you still on? Yes, sir. Go ahead, uh, go ahead and, 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 and answer that question. You might, you can give them the, the data. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, like I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest challenges is that we don't really have much to act upon here in this day. We have three sites, not much of which is coming out of them. Um, you know, I think that, you know, <laughs> you know, the, those particular sites are in extremely rural areas as well. Um, you know, there just hasn't been a whole lot to, to use in the state thus far, which is, you know, where we're coming from, I think. I, have, I can give a couple examples from Utah. Um, one thing we've been doing a lot less now that the state has drastically cut back state um, finance or resourced testing individual testing initiatives but beginning back very beginning of 2021 or so we put together it's essentially a composite metric um, to help rank we, we use a sort of a utah specific geography we just call small areas or we divide the state up into 99 different geographic areas based roughly uh, population size, community boundaries, that sort of thing. And we use that in public health quite a bit. So we came up with this composite metric that used wastewater uh, surveillance data in addition to 14 day case rate, seven day percent positivity to kind of build a ranking every week for which of these small areas were most concerning to help direct um, primarily mobile testing resources into these areas. Um, and it seemed to work quite well because we needed some we had, we couldn't just send tests everywhere. 
Um, and because there just weren't, there wasn't sufficient resources. So we need some method for prioritizing where we should be sending these limited resources. And we wanted to make use of, of wastewater surveillance data as a independent metric, because it's difficult to use solely individual level testing data to send out individual level testing resources. You're gonna find cases where you're already looking for cases. Um, so having this independent data source was very helpful in that regard. And we recently made an update to incorporate also syndromic surveillance into a, a more, really more complicated, but very similar in idea metric as well. Um, and I think it's also been very useful, less for public health action, I think, but just because of the nature of what I'm going to talk about. And Amy, I remember, made this point as well. But there have been times where, especially the, the time I remember um, well, both now, actually now is a great example where we had extraordinarily high case rates at the height of the, our Omicron wave, and then everything came way, way back down. At that same time, we had our, our testing rates, individual level testing rates also were coming way, way back down. And in fact, at the height of our Omicron wave, the state had to tell people to, unless you're actively sick, stop showing up at our testing sites because they're just overwhelmed. That doesn't do good things for reliability of that data, of course. Um, Thankfully, you know, things like wastewater data, wastewater surveillance data and syndromic surveillance data aren't reliant on individual testing data. So we're able to use that to help determine whether, okay, so we're seeing declining case rates, but testing rates are also declining. Is that just an artifact? The fact that we're not testing as many people, we're not finding the cases that are actually there. And so we're able to use things like wastewater data to help confirm or disconfirm that particular hypothesis based on what we're seeing since it's not relying on that. And I think, you know, that's where, again, where the independent data source become, it comes into play. And I think that's just incredibly useful and becomes more so as time goes on. Oh, am I? Sorry. Shoot. Did it work? Okay, good. Sorry. I just wanted to ask a, a teeny quick follow-up. So um, from like what you're describing is something I, is very familiar to me too. And I, I just wanted to ask how much, so when, when the signals from wastewater and from other, you know, data streams are kind of in alignment, I feel like wastewater can be very helpful to kind of say, yes, this is real. But have you had any issues with, um, because wastewater is such a new system with when you see a, a spike in wastewater, but not in some of these other systems, people don't know how much to trust the wastewater data in part because it's so new and we don't know how to interpret it yet. And I wanted to see if you've had that experience or what you've, how you've helped dealt with that. Yeah, absolutely. We have, and I would say, especially early on. So we, we were one of those early adopter states. We just had the right confluence of resources and, and people in the academic world with expertise who wanted to contribute and the partner agency who wanted to contribute. So we got sampling up and going, you know, in a pilot phase early 2020. Um, and there, there was, I always kind of termed it inertia because I don't think it's resistance per se, but there's, you know, thinking back to when Amy was talking about those time frames, like a more usual time scale for implementing one of these systems, there's more time to, for people to get used to the idea of this as a data source and get used to what it might mean and the strengths and limitations of it as well and to take all that into account. And that's been, you know, drastically compressed, especially at a time when decisions had to be made now by people who were already utterly overwhelmed. And so I think continually proving that it works. And then, you know, here's an example of what we saw. Ideally, in your, in your area, in your jurisdiction, here's an example of when what we are saying now also happened. And so this is why we should trust it now and all these other examples. So that can be very helpful, I think. And I've seen a lot less of this as time has gone on. And I think there's just been a lessening of that inertia as people become more familiar with it. And we've we and in other states and CDC has proven continually that this can be a very, very useful data system. You know, it's not without its flaws, just like any data system, um, but it, it has some real, real strengths as well. And, you know, especially now when the alternatives are kind of thin on the ground, there's not many other sources of good data right now, but ours is still just as good as it always has been. Um, and I think people are, are beginning to recognize that. So I think it's a process of time. It's a process of continually proving and, and working to improve and transparency as well, being open about 
you know, this is what I think it means, or, you know, I think this is concerning, but we don't, we're not really sure of all the specifics yet, but it's something that we really need to pay attention to and keep a close eye on. All right, I wanna thank, uh, thank each of you for your presentations, your willingness to, to answer questions. Um, we're gonna take a break. Um, we will reconvene and we will be actually in action at 40 after. I would say 35 after, but I just don't believe that would happen. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna start sharp at, at 40 after the hour. So, so again, thank you all. All right, um, welcome back everyone after that short break. Um, we're gonna have several CDC speakers um, now talk about what the vision of the National Wastewater Surveillance System is. Um, and first, I don't know if we're gonna hear from Rory or Amy. They will, it's Rory. Yeah, I, I got I the slide now. <laughs> I, I just had to look up. Um, yep. um, so I'm Rory Welsh, I'm the laboratory lead for our National Wastewater Surveillance System. I'm gonna give a uh, brief overview on our future goals and visions of news. Um, and if you can't hear me or if there's any issues, uh, just speak up, but I'll assume everything's good. Um, I think I have control here. Yep. Uh, so I'm starting with just that familiar overview uh, slide for um, what we have for our, our national wastewater surveillance system. And really this is at its foundation, what it was built for PCR type uh, assay data. What's missing here is um, sequence data. So, um, you know, in response to emerging variants, we had to rapidly build in the capacity to uh, incorporate uh, sequencing data into our surveillance program. We always thought that pathogen, uh, wastewater pathogen genomics would be uh, uh, an important layer to wastewater surveillance, but, um, you know, the, the urge of the pandemic just kind of uh, sped up that, that process. And so I'm um, going to go over a little bit later in this talk, but just on the onset, I wanted to give kind of a, a high level overview of how we're doing this. So. Um, in our process, we're trying to maximize timely data submission. We're doing this in a, a couple different ways. Um, our uh, decipher analysis platform at CDC is a cloud-based platform. Um, our state and local public health laboratories have well um, hard-railed data for their clinical uh, SARS-CoV-2 data submissions into our, our national data repositories at NCBI. Um, the sequence read archive, the, the SRA is in the cloud. So we can have cloud to cloud transfer of data. Um, a lot of the, the requirements for submitting data to NCBI are, are similar requirements that we have for submitting wastewater concentration data to our, our news wastewater surveillance platform. Um, and so oftentimes you'll have a, a sample come in for wastewater testing and, and based on whether or not that's positive, that will trigger that sample to then go on for, for sequencing. So you'll have that PCR based information uh, ahead of the sequencing information. And so we're developing workflows for our Decipher platform where you could give those list of sample identifiers um, and all that information that you've already submitted to the news platform will be pre-populated into the submission forms that you have to uh, send in with your sequence data. And this is a kind of encouraging positive feedback for timely data submission. Um, uh, in addition, we're, we're uh, big proponents of open data and sharing and uh, getting data out there. And so the the NCBI data repositories are, are open to the public and they're used for a host of uh, third-party platforms. Think about the uh, NCBI TRACE program, the NIH-funded uh, Rosalind program, the outbreak.info. Um, and so we want uh, the submitters and the generators of the sequence data to adhere to some, some standards so that uh, this data is findable, uh, interoperable, and, and useful for uh, a range of different things. Um, because the, the wastewater concentration data and the sequencing data, these are, are critical public health intelligence. And while we implemented uh, our national wastewater surveillance system for COVID, it was built to be a multi-pathogen uh, detection platform that was capable of uh, rapidly adapting to changing public health needs. Uh, and so at the, the core of what we do, we, we want to be a, a nimble structure that's readily adaptable, whether that's uh, bioterrorism threats or uh, emergency response in the wake of some natural disaster or uh, a short-term activation for uh, emerging infections, um, or what we've seen throughout this pandemic is uh, pandemic response and pandemic preparedness. Um, so there are three 
kind of main buckets for our uh, wastewater surveillance strategies. There's the core, and these are, are common endemic diseases such as influenza, uh, now SARS-CoV-2, RSV, norovirus. Uh, here we can provide regular consistent updates at, at a very minimal cost, right? There's a, a single sample from that, that wastewater treatment plant. Um, the next bucket is emergency. So here we have uh, a rapid response for an outbreak or a bio uh, security threat. And here we can provide acute timely information and updates uh, that are all on a flexible platform that can change as the underlying conditions uh, change on the ground. Uh, the third one is special studies. So th this is for surveillance of diseases that disproportionately impact a region or a demographic. And here we can provide like really specific timely data um, for diseases of concern. So that may or may not be widespread uh, throughout that, that particular area. Um, recently, uh, in association with the, um, the APHL uh, organization, they, they uh, produced this uh, wastewater guidance document, and this provides an overview of SARS-CoV-2 wastewater laboratory setup and Atlantic, uh, analytical processes that orient public health laboratories as they're, they're trying to implement testing. And I'm, I'm highlighting just table one from this guidance document here because you can see that um, what we've done with uh, our National Wastewater Surveillance Program is built it based off the existing capacity that we had to rapidly have some uh, data available in the midst of a pandemic. Everybody's dealt with the supply chain uh, shortages that have impacted everything. And so by having this lead of a thousand methods bloom approach, uh, we've sidestepped a lot of those uh, pain points. Now we're not totally immune to it. Um, and then we've also had tremendous amount of innovation. So we have uh, a laundry list of concentration extraction methods that uh, provide robust results for SARS-CoV-2 wastewater testing. Uh, but this has also led to a lot of issues. And as we look to expand beyond SARS-CoV-2, we really need to consolidate on a single test type. Um, and, and primarily that's just so that this data is mutually trusted and understood uh, across our, our national testing uh, laboratories. And so what we're trying to implement is a, a testing panel that is quantitative. Um, it's capable of multiplexing or being uh, massively parallel. Um, and it's readily adaptable. Um, it's also a difficult sample type wastewater, so it needs to be robust to inhibitors uh, and capable of really low levels of detection. And really the, the digital PCR uh, platform satisfies all these requirements. And luckily for news, we already have multiple testing laboratories that are utilizing either the, um, the 296 well plat digital PCR platforms, the, the BioRed or the Kiagen system. So we're really going to optimize our uh, news testing panel for uh, these two digital platform systems. Um, so this uh, news uh, expanded version one panel will include uh, fecal normalization control, a process control, uh, antibiotic resistant targets, uh, as well as pathogen targets. Um, we'll regularly update or review this, this panel uh, with our advisory committee that we're forming to um, really kind of um, take a deep look at, at what we have on, on this panel and whether or not we need to make uh, changes and, and what is and isn't working. Um, and we'll also develop uh, kind of an emergency uh, assay uh, use panel that uh, can be implemented in certain areas if you have um, particular outbreaks that uh, could also serve as kind of ground truthing for the, the next uh, round of, of targets to include. So for the, the pathogens, um, we have this table here of potential targets. There's an asterisk just to note that uh, this uh, panel composition is not final and is uh, subject to, to change. Um, the criteria for the selection of these targets were that it, it has to be shed in, in stools during infection. Um, and it's something that's uh, not commonly shed post-infection in chronically ill patients that aren't at risk of ongoing transmission. Um, it has to remain stable enough to detect nucleic acids. Um, and they're can't be significant technical challenges to molecular detection. You'll notice uh, cyclospores on this list. That's a really hardy organism that requires some mechanical lysis and so might not easily fold into routine um, wastewater testing and surveillance. Um, and it has to be useful data that uh, kind of complements current uh, existing surveillance. 
Um, so now on this table, I have the uh, antimicrobial resistance mechanisms and the genes of interest and the consideration for these AR targets are that they're, they're clinically significant resistance. And we're gonna give priority to emergence, uh, emerging high resistant or high consequence genes. Um, and, and really the, the data has to be actionable, right? For, for public health um, and not really present in some commensals or environmental bacteria that are gonna be present in our, our wastewater samples. And there's, there's trade-offs between large groups or very specific genes that, that we're still kind of working through um, on what's kind of optimal. But uh, the timeline for this testing is that we'll have an expanded panel that's available for all of our testing laboratories in 2023. Right now we're working on finalizing that uh, assay list, doing the testing and validations of, of these assays. And then late uh, fall of 2022, uh, we hope to have uh, the initial piloting testing occurring in some select uh, states, as well as uh, these centers of excellence that we're funding through the ELC program. Um, last point before I turn to sequencing is uh, in that APHL guidance document, there was uh, uh, a link to protocols.io. And I, I really think that this will be important for our surveillance program just to have uh, open resources to the methods, the assays that are being used so that if there are, um, you know, problems or issues with the assays, it's, it's clear, you know, what the primers and probes are and, and, and what uh, new mutations for circulating uh, variants might be causing uh, potential issues there. And that's not just for wet lab, but also for our bioinformatic processes. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to switch gears to uh, wastewater sequencing data and variant tracking. Um, and, and just starting off with how we're, we're dealing with our, our data ingestion plan. So uh, we have a umbrella project for organizing all this sequencing data that's part of uh, the news uh, testing system uh, in NCBI. We also worked with NCBI to uh, ensure that we could have human read uh, scrub uh, occur for any wastewater sequence data that's submitted as part of uh, news testing. Um, this is all just to kind of standardize uh, our wastewater sequencing data as much as possible. Um, there's uh, uh, multiple different ways that you could go about um, kind of pre-filtering the, the human reads out of uh, your sequence data sets before uh, analyses. And we wanna try to head that off in a, in a standardized approach that's been validated and, and trusted for uh, a host of other projects um, that are already in NCBI. Um, and then we also wanted to provide kind of uh, a step-by-step -step approach for, for how to kind of uh, aggregate this data, the metadata, the when, where the samples were collected and, and get that into um, the NCBI public uh, data repository. There are a couple key fields that are in the required submission um, template documents that, that are needed to submit any data to the, the um, sequence read archive. And we can use those key fields like sample ID and the, uh, and the decipher platform and then the, the wastewater surveillance system sample ID uh, in NCBI to link the wastewater concentration data to the sequencing data. Um, so that you can overlay these two results in our uh, decipher platform. Um, and then uh, we've worked with uh, uh, FDA on our, our kind of guidance documents and uh, templates. So Ruth Timmy and others uh, in the genome tracker group have built this uh, protocols.io step-by-step protocol and they utilize the news data dictionary uh, for some of the pick lists that are on these uh, submission guidance documents. So now we have uh, two federal agencies that are trying to align as much as possible on um, our wastewater uh, uh, sequencing data. And, and we're utilizing the, the phage um, kind of attributes and standardization processes there. Um, so as we shift gears from uh, data ingestion to data analysis, uh, we also wanted to provide um, at least one standardized uh, wastewater sequence analysis approach that uh, all groups could be able to speak apples to apples and, and know um, whatever differences they're seeing from their homebrew uh, analyses, they can at least look to this common wastewater analysis pipeline. So this is uh, FDA developed um, wastewater analysis pipeline, CWAP. Uh, it's a bioinformatic pipeline that's capable of ingesting both long read and short read data um, and giving both mutations, QC results, and uh, relative abundance of, of variants through the, the Freya uh, deconvolution approach. Um, this uh, is also included in XFlow implementation for reproducibility and packaging. Um, and in addition, we've uh, 
incorporated this into our um, news wastewater cloud-based analysis platform. Uh, so this is a scalable uh, cloud computing pipeline that we can uh, scale up if uh, a state decides to dump a backlog of a thousand or more samples and we can quickly run the analysis overnight or we can scale down when there's just a trickle of one or two samples coming in, we're not burning resources. Um, the analysis pipeline is open source, anyone can uh, access it. We have uh, standard uh, QC thresholds uh, for general sequencing uh, metrics like Q scores, as well as genome breadth and depth um, that can be um, uh, filtered so that you can see the, those results uh, on your, your main dashboard. And all the, the sequencing data can be summarized and linked to the concentration data. So we're still iterating over the, the final visualizations here, uh, but what we're, we're prioritizing is just a relatively simplified news dashboard um, that will allow jurisdictions to see for their jurisdictions for a key wastewater uh, treatment plant of interest. What is the overall variant proportion uh, that are present in these samples? They'll um, also be able to, to check key mutations of interest. Um, and link up that sequencing data with the wastewater concentration data. Um, but if this pandemic has proved anything is we can't be just looking one way. So we're building out a, uh, a secondary uh, system where you can have detailed wastewater uh, analyses, uh, query individual mutations, uh, adjust those uh, QC thresholds um, to look at, at key regions of mutations and then also incorporate data beyond just our, our news testing partners. So international projects, FDA's uh, wastewater project and other academic wastewater uh, sequencing data. Um, and then all of this, you'll be able to download the, the raw results uh, the same way that you can download your wastewater concentration data from um, our, our news decipher platform. So uh, final note is this was mentioned earlier, but our jurisdictions that have been funded for wastewater sequence or testing are at all different stages. And so to rapidly expand our coverage uh, for wastewater surveillance throughout the US, we have a uh, commercial contract that's out. It's uh, just recently been awarded the nine month contract to um, a commercial company Biobot. And this is gonna provide uh, quantitative testing as well as sequencing uh, testing for 500 utilities uh, that will provide twice uh, weekly testing throughout all 50 states and territories. Um, as with uh, what Zach presented earlier, the concentration data is all publicly available on data.cdc.gov. Um, the COVID data tracker uh, data is also available uh, through COVID data tracker and then the, the historical data is in that data.cdc.gov. Um, the sequencing data that we have is all gonna be publicly available under the news umbrella project. Um, and so all of this uh, information uh, can be found and contributed to other uh, public health uh, tools and um, also research and innovation. So I'll stop it there. I tried to run through that fairly quickly. So we had time for questions um, and I see there's a bunch coming in, in the chat. <laughs> Okay. Luckily, you guys seem to be answering some of these questions. I don't know if someone wants to read them out or how, how do we address uh, the Q&A session from here? I'm, I'm going to chime in as soon as I catch up with the, it was kind of going. Oh, okay, Scott, go ahead. So I'll, I'll start the cascade there. I think Raul started it by mentioning the PMMOV or you mentioned PMOV and um, you know, these are biological agents in, in stool. And yeah, you can use them for a, a recovery control a bit, but normalizing based on those automatically incorporates their natural variability into your estimate. And it's just like the basic indicator concept where our pathogens don't necessarily correlate to our coliform numbers, right? And right. so you're building in additional variability. So my, my, gut feeling and is supported by evidence we've seen in Seattle at least is that it does not correlate with flow. It does not make those changes based on, you know, biobot data we've seen. Um, they made adjustments initially based on PMMOV, but it did not correlate with any change in flow. 
So I, I just think we really need to hammer on this issue and, and come up with a good justification if we're going to adjust numbers. Flow and population seem pretty robust. And I know that's not always available, but it's something we should definitely talk through, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're, we're also incorporating additional layers that will help address that, like the mobility data. So um, just because you have a, a, a population for a given sewer shed doesn't account for uh, like a Super Bowl event or, or things like that. And so um, in the absence of these other layers, these, uh, you know, fecal normalization controls do provide some additional data. And so um, I put in there that this is version one of our expanded yeah. panel. And we, we will definitely be uh, looking closely at these and, and whether or not they serve utility to crowd out maybe a, a, a useful AR target that that would be more useful for our surveillance program. Yeah, but I mean, we're look, talking orders of magnitude variability here. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, for PMOV, just the, the fact that you need to dilute samples because of the, the extremely strong signal there um, also uh, adds another layers of complexity for testing. So um, yeah, these are- So, so that raises a, another issue and, and I'll, I'll end up to this one, but the question of inhibition. We have also seen that depending on the method you're using, inhibition significantly affects the concentration that you're, you're coming up with on your methods. And I know digital is better than the standard qPCR, but are, is there any plan to incorporate specific inhibition controls? And if so, what are they going to do with those? Are they going to uh, adjust the concentrations on the sample or just rule the sample in and out? Yeah, the inhibition is, uh, you know, something that, uh, is a, a real problem for the variability that we're seeing for, for wastewater uh, testing data. And um, the idea of having your inhibition controls and using that to, to rule out samples um, has been something that's had different approaches for different groups. Some have identified uh, sampling points or, or treatment plants that are just notoriously bad for inhibition and then they uh, you know, do their dilutions uh, before all testing, whereas others, uh, it's not really a, an issue for those. Uh, and so um, I think we're going to have to have some thresholds, uh, at least initially, while we, we work through all these, uh, these variabilities that we see. Um, so you might uh, set up a manhole testing site in a location that's working well, and then a car wash opens up uh, just upstream up there, and all of a sudden, uh, your data is just wrecked. Um, so it's, a, it's really a problem. All right, I'm going to go to Sandra, and then I'm going to come back to, to Rob or Ami around the human reed scrubbing issue. So, Sandra. Yeah, I, great presentation. Thanks for that, Rory. Um, I had a lot of questions kind of along the same lines as Scott. And rather than get into the specifics, although the one I will point out is flow, um, in, in we have these extra large plants. And we actually see that um, when there's flow, we don't see a dilution of the, you know, a lot of our fecal indicators or the SARS-CoV-2. And we suspect that flow co co corresponds with um, scouring. So there's a lot of trade-offs on these normalizations. And I know when we normalized um, to different things like PMMOV and, and again, we're in larger systems, but so every system is different, but between PMMOV, some of the bacterial indicators or um, just normalizing to flow, we saw the best correlation when we did nothing. Um, so I thought that kind of spoke to, you know, that there's so many unknowns that, and, and trade-offs. So I guess my question is, how will you decide these things? You know, there's so much um, maybe science that still needs to be done to re really nail down these dynamics and what we're actually measuring and these trade-offs. But that needs to be balanced with needing to make decisions. So how are you going to kind of um, hone in on the targets? And I'm especially interested in these normalization factors and how will they kind of be evaluated as you go forward if you should stick with them or maybe go back to the drawing board? Yeah, so the, those are all great questions, Sandra. And, you know, my response is, I think data builds trust. And so by incorporating lots of these uh, human fecal controls in the initial uh, uh, news expanded panel, we can get data on, on multiple different market uh, markers for a wide range of uh, utilities and, 
uh, sampling conditions. And so with that initial data, we can really drive down uh, into what does and doesn't make sense in terms of a long-term surveillance approach. But the idea of just doing nothing gives us no data to, to actually assess and, and, and work off of. Uh, so I, I think it's gonna be something that we need to get consistent data for at least a defined period of time and have you know, quarterly uh, reviews to see what is and isn't actually improving uh, that correlation between the wastewater concentration data and, you know, the, the overall syndromic uh, surveillance data that we have. Are, um, maybe there's certain areas that have really uh, high levels of clinical testing uh, or, or other information that we can kind of uh, uh, use that as a gold standard to kind of compare the two together. Great. Yeah, thanks for that. Rob. Um, hey, Rory, uh, great presentation. Um, I, I just had a question about the human read filtering, which is um, which is a really hard problem, and we were just in the position of having to reprocess terabytes of data with the new uh, human genome build, which includes a better Y chromosome um, uh, from long read sequencing, and uh, that picks up a whole lot of sequences that were missed previously. But, uh, but I was wondering, for, for this application, there's a lot of concern um, especially about minority populations and potential reuse of the data. Um, what, what procedure are you thinking about to take into account um, the indels that are specific to different populations that may not be adequately represented in the, in the current human genome reference databases? And will that be an important consideration for depositing the data in a way that's reusable, but at the same time uh, protects those populations from having their human reads deposited. Yeah, so we, we don't want to be throwing away uh, informative data that could actually uh, help for, for the targets that we have, but we also don't want to uh, accidentally release any um, you know uh, human data that, that might be incorporated there. So our, our current approach was to standardize on uh, the NCBI uh, human read scrubber that they have. And uh, you bring up a, a good point where, you know, none of these tools are perfect. Um, and so uh, maybe it's worth uh, pilot projects that can find ways that we can flag and remove some of these indels and other uh, sequences that might pass through the initial uh, filtering approach. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's certainly a problem where there's no real um, great answer here. It's either we uh, wall off this data and we don't allow it for, for public use, or uh, we take a, a really hard line stringent approach and we throw away a lot of useful data. Um, but letting all the different jurisdictions um, come up with a, a, their own approach also breeds a lot of inconsistency uh, in terms of a, a uniform surveillance approach. So um, yeah, thank you for that question. That, that, that's a good point. There's intermediate approaches like dbGaP, where it's public, publicly accessible but gated. Although, if you can if you can find a way to keep it out of dbGaP while at the same time uh, while at the same time maintaining privacy, uh, that greatly lowers the barrier to reuse and would certainly be highly desirable if it can be done that way. That's a good point. Yeah. New Raj. Thanks. So I had a more kind of uh, big picture question that uh, say if you have a limited pot of money, <clears throat> you could do two things with it. You could either <clears throat> just expand the current surveillance system to you know, include more sites, more frequent testing, et cetera. Or you could invest more in research to figure out like what is actually the value of data we are getting from the existing system. Is it, you know, is it valuable in leading kind of public health action or, you know, trying to figure out if there was a bioterrorism attack, would the current system actually work or we just think it'll work, but we really don't have credible evidence that it would work. So I'm just curious, like, which one of those parts would you invest more in? Yeah, I mean, there's trade-offs with both. So if you go with the, the kind of refined detailed approach where you can really hone in on, on a couple specific questions, run the risk of, uh, you know, there not being a prevalence of the target that you're after. And, and then you, you walk away with uh, 
not a whole lot of data. And then if you don't expand uh, to a broad national scale, especially at times like this, where our clinical surveillance is uh, that those denominators are, are getting a lot less useful and, and that data is becoming more sparse, you, you risk areas of the US population going dark and we could have spreading wildfires that we have no view on whether or not we have increases in uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the like. Um, and so, I mean, our approach was to get some baseline uh, expansion of wastewater testing on a national scale, but we have funded specific projects that do look at, at particular scenarios like what you're, you're suggesting here. So we have uh, one mechanism, which is the, the broad agency awards. Um, and we funded a, uh, a study at a university system actually here in, here in Georgia, the um, University of Georgia has detailed patient clinical information, uh, as well as uh, detailed testing on their campus population and wastewater surveillance at the facility dorm level, uh, as well as um, you know from the the public health system. Uh, Rob Knight uh, also has a group with uh, uh, the UC system where they've done the same thing there, uh, and so those are two examples of having uh, really high level trusted clinical data that they can pair with wastewater data to really see what's the the maximum kind of endpoint. For, for this surveillance approach. And so I think we're, we're trying to do both at the same time here. Um, and uh, as we look to expand beyond SARS-CoV-2, I think we'll try to get a broad coverage um, so that we can get data across, you know, uh, a, a large uh, geographic population here in the US. Uh, but we'll still need these kind of detailed study approaches in order to see uh, what, what the limits are. Thank you. Scott, we have time for your, if you want to ask those questions as our last question, uh, the ones you put in the chat, we could do that. Sure. <laughs> Although I can't open chat and mute at the same time, apparently. Um, so I had two general questions. The first one, uh, well, one general and one specific one. Maybe we'll, since we're talking about sequences, do the, the specific one first. When you're looking at the, the variant tracking question, are you seeing uh, every sample is going to be sequenced from here on out? Or are you looking at to use that sequence data to generate specific primer sets that we can quantify and target directly um, individual variants? Yeah, so um, what many groups did at the onset of sequencing wastewater was to take the same clinical tiled amplicon approach and then apply it to wastewater. Um, but then with each new uh, variant that comes out, they're, they're really hammering on that primer set. And so you get areas of the genome that just go dark and you have to incorporate new primers. Uh, and so any kind of primer targeted approach is gonna run that risk. But I think that in terms of uh, return on investment, uh, for not just sequencing background and noise and actually doing a targeted sequencing approach, there's going to have to be some type of rapid uh, kind of tiled targeting sequencing approach until that sequencing costs uh, or capabilities uh, improve. Um, and so the, that's been uh, shown to be kind of a successful strategy. It does have its drawbacks, but when you're talking about AR uh, pathogens or um, like the emerging multi-drug resistant yeast uh, candidaurus, you can do targeted regions of the genome and get information about, um, you know, what clade is circulating and it goes beyond just presence absence, uh, but to, to what subtype is, is there. Okay. So following on that, the, the sequencing, then if we're using sequencing moving forward, what, what is that going to do to your timeline? I know you want to make it as timely as possible and that's the mm -hmm. focus, but, you know, assembly and, and analysis of sequence data is, is, not quick. Um, exactly, and even generation of that, that sequencing data. So a lot of these workflows, you wouldn't trigger a sample to be sequenced unless you had a concentration that was above a certain threshold because your likelihood of getting usable data was just not there. Um, and so that timeline issue, I think is going to be a, a little bit extended the same way that we have for clinical testing where you get your PCR positive negative and then it go, gets forwarded on to, to sequencing. Um, we have the nine month contract that I referenced earlier. We have a, a requirement from when the samples arrive to when that data is publicly available of 10 days. So it's not 
you know, weeks, you're not a historian of, you know, an outbreak, you're still getting somewhat timely data, but it's not going to be as rapid as your, your digital PCR. Now, some of our really well-funded laboratories, uh, like, again, Rob, I'm picking on you, but do your Previous publications have uh, pretty remarkable turnarounds for for wastewater sequencing data. I don't know that our standard uh, public health laboratories are going to be able to replicate that in the near future, but that's our goal to kind of optimize the efficiency and turnaround time for everything from our concentration-based testing to our sequencing testing. So my second question was very general, and it, this this may predate your time at CDC, but um, I, I'm curious to what extent with with the fallout from BioWatch and the false positives as we were doing kind of the, you know, biodefense surveillance, um, that rollout to the, the state health labs was not, um, well, it had issues, a lot of reagents going um, stale and, and other things. So how, how have the lessons learned from that been incorporated in the rollout of news to the state labs? Yeah, I mean, that was a, a national program that was instituted by the Department of Defense, uh, whereas this is directly public health and, and public health run. So the funding mechanism that we use is the, the ELC funding that uh, state public health systems can budget and then uh, you know kind of run their own um, organization for uh, how they're going to actually land on the deliverables of, of testing. We're also working with companies. So right now there are two digital PCR platforms that support 96 well uh, plate formats. That's the Kaijin and BioRed. And so we're working with these companies to just say, you know, we're hearing concerns about supply chain and not just for kits, reagents and instruments, but also technicians getting out in timely fashion. So working with them to have, build in additional safety reserves and also uh, what, what they have in terms of, uh, you know, staff to, to really make sure that we don't have areas going dark for our wastewater surveillance because of, of things like the, they can't get a technician out there for, for the instrument. Um, so uh, these are, you know, these are problems that are forefront in our mind, especially with the uh, supply chain issues that everyone's felt during this pandemic. Thanks. All right. Thank, thanks very much. And thank you, Rory, for, for excellent presentation and being willing to answer all, all those questions. Um, our um, final speaker today is Vince Hill, um, who um, basically um, directs the, the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch at CDC. And he's going to discuss the motivation and value, um, hopefully, of uh, this National Academy study. Yeah, uh, th thanks very much. Um, yeah, and it's really a, a pleasure to be here. I mean, wow, that last, just based on that last uh, presentation and all the conversation and the chat around there, it's just, it's just thrilling, uh, frankly. I mean, for myself, I want to go back to the laboratory. My training's in environmental uh, microbiology and uh, engineering. So uh, just super exciting to have so much uh, expertise and experience, you know, focused on this, on this, on this matter. Uh, so Really excited for the kickoff of, the, of this process. We're going to do this. Uh, I'm going to rely on uh, folks from Nason to kind of advance my slides. So next slide, please. I think I'm there. We go. Thank you. Um, so you know, over the course of today, um, you've heard about the design and implementation of news, as well as some of the challenges imposed by rapidly standing up a new surveillance system within the context of an unprecedented pandemic response. Um, you know, it's just been incredible to see in the uh, last 19 months or so, uh, academic researchers, utilities, state and local health departments, private companies, and multiple federal agencies, you know, have built infrastructure to do so many things. It's been incredible. So including to collect wastewater samples uh, from communities of all sizes across the country um, and measure the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in wastewater samples, despite the differences in lab capacity, Supply chain challenge, supply chain challenges that we had early, especially early in the pandemic, uh, and the changing biology of the virus. Uh, infrastructure has been built to transmit the test data and all of the necessary sample metadata to state and federal databases. Um, infrastructure to analyze the data and to report the results to health departments and communities in near real time, um, generally within five to seven days after sample collection. Um, 
So, and then state and local public health agencies, you know, are using this data to inform response decisions, particularly resource allocation. Um, and we've seen just an incredible increase in interest from, uh, from the public. So for example, um, the wastewater surveillance page on a COVID data tracker is the most visited page uh, after the data tracker landing page. Um, uh, and the public, so the public is clearly interested uh, in better understanding the status of COVID in their communities. And it's, you know, it's really exciting to consider that they may be using this data to inform their day-to-day -day choices and understanding what's going on in their communities. So it's really exciting. Uh, next slide, thank you. So despite these successes, there are still areas of development for news uh, to build better science around wastewater surveillance and to build a more sustainable surveillance system. Um, so thinking about some of these areas, uh, it's clear that better metrics are needed, uh, especially measures uh, that are scientifically valid, uh, but also readily interpretable for non-experts. Um, and as we move to <clears throat> a multi-pathogen system, um, we will need to reevaluate the appropriate sampling frames uh, for wastewater surveillance. So things like, you know, which locations should be prioritized? Uh, what is the appropriate sampling frequency? Um, the answer to these questions will likely be different for each target. Um, so, you know, is there a reasonable single sampling frame or do we need to accommodate different approaches for different targets? <clears throat> for a uh, testing-based system such as NEWS, there is always space for improved methods. Um, and so while we want to make the assays more sensitive and more specific, we also want to streamline the workflow to minimize uh, handling, reduce opportunities for errors, increase throughput, and standardize data outputs. And you know, we saw in the context of the COVID response, we still need to understand the impact of vaccination and variants on fecal shedding it has a big in, in, uh, impact on the data. Um, and another important context for this is uh, the data modernization initiative that CDC has undertaken uh, to improve data flow, data sharing, and data compatibility across the agency's many data systems. Uh, we have been including data modernization principles in news data systems from the start, but there are more improvements to be made, especially around automated data transfers. And finally, uh, wastewater surveillance, like other environmental microbiology activities, exists outside the ethical frameworks for clinical testing. Um, but the impacts of many of the same, but, but the, um, the surveillance impacts many of the same principles. So things like consent, privacy, and stigma are, are really important to consider for wastewater surveillance. Like they're well, well thought of and considered through clinical testing. We really need to have those in place and thought of around uh, wastewater surveillance. We must be transparent uh, with communities about you know, what data are collected, what information is not collected, and who is making decisions um, about these samples. Next. So um, as news develops, we want to ensure that we are following the best science. Um, any organization has potential blind spots uh, and can develop tunnel vision uh, in its initiatives. Uh, which create challenges to identify looming problems and novel opportunities um, as we drive towards our, you know, it's our goals. Um, so developing news so rapidly and under such extreme circumstances uh, presented by the pandemic required prioritizing efficiency. Um, so we want to ensure that we aren't sacrificing rigor uh, in this process. Uh, wastewater surveillance requires expertise from a broad group of stakeholders, uh, including wastewater engineers, environmental and clinical microbiologists, epidemiologists, and health communicators. So there's no better way to access the best of this varied expertise than through um, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So super excited for this to get started. So really, the time is now. This is perfect to be doing this right now. The science has grown rapidly. Um, for example, since 2020, over 1,100 articles have been published on wastewater surveillance. You know, and we have the opportunity to direct new research where it is most needed. Um, so the information from this process is gonna be really influential for that. Um, and this is the time to lever leverage this moment of great support uh, and investment in public health to build sustainable systems to prepare us for the future. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, as this expert panel process begins, I'd like to revisit the statement of task for the panel. And, and thanks to the guy Palmer for reviewing this uh, a bit earlier. Um, so the NASM expert review is divided into two phases. Uh, the first part of phase one is a landscape analysis, uh, which includes answering some pretty fundamental questions. Um, like, you know, what is wastewater surveillance? Um, characterizing that. But how is it different from existing surveillance and wastewater monitoring systems? Uh, how has wastewater surveillance been used within the COVID response? And, you know, what has worked and what hasn't? Next slide. So the second part of phase one is an evaluation of implementation strategies and approaches. Here we want the panel to expand its review beyond COVID-19 and consider applications for other infectious diseases. We really look forward to hearing the panel's views on opportunities to contribute to the control and prevention of disease more broadly um, and where there may be hurdles to expanded use. Uh, one thing to note uh, in the interest of keeping the scope of the review manageable uh, is that we are not including uh, non-infectious agents uh, in this panel review. Uh, next, uh, we are asking that the panel consider the characteristics of a robust national surveillance system. Things like, you know, how should it be structured? What are the roles for each implementing partner? How should it be coordinated? Um, what guardrails need to be in place to ensure that the data will be used only in support of the public good? Um, to keep the scope of the review within reason, uh, we encourage you to focus on community level surveillance. Um, rather than applications at the building level um, and to focus on implementation in the United States rather than broader global implementations or you know, in, in low resource settings. And, and finally for this phase, we'd like to hear from the panel on ways we can increase the public health impact of wastewater surveillance. Uh, next slide, thanks. So then in phase two, uh, you will have the opportunity to really dig into the technical details. Uh, we've heard a lot of technical details so far uh, just, just today. So this is going to be really exciting to, to hear what you, uh, your discussions and what you put forward uh, in this area. So, you know, addressing issues like what are the strengths and limitations of different sampling designs, uh, laboratory methods, and analytic approaches? Um, are there other data sources that can be combined with wastewater data to provide stronger analyses? And as in phase one, in phase two here, the focus is going to be on uh, infectious diseases. Um, finally, the panel should uh, describe the research uh, and development needs, as well as the resources needed to support wastewater surveillance. Um, so actually, that's that's my last informational slide. But you know, just a couple thoughts in closing. Um, you know, over the past two years, it has been so impressive to watch uh, an entire field turn its focus to wastewater surveillance. So many have volunteered their time and the resources to build wastewater surveillance capacity. News would not exist without them. Um, and we want to thank the panel again for giving your time and expertise in this effort. Um, news and public health will benefit greatly from, from your input and your efforts uh, through this. So really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vince. Um, I'm sure there's going to be questions, but I'm going to take prerogative and jump in uh, first. Um, but because one of the questions that has kind of come up, and it was actually it's something I've been thinking about for a while, but in the presentation from Utah, um, they had 40 some sites they tested. And kind of my question is do they need, do they really need 40 or do they need fewer that are representative? Um, and that's where you concentrate your resources, or do they need more um, to, to get coverage? And it kind of comes down to, to something that Michelle and I were talking about is, what's the definition of community? Um, because that, you know, I, I feel like it's a legal thing. You're trying to decide what the definition of is is, which if you have a long memory, you could might, <laughs> might remember when that came up. Um, but when CDC looks at community, um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I, and I know, I'll just from my perspective, I know the team has really thought through this a lot. And, and certainly within the, the context of these, you know, national commercial testing contracts, et cetera, um, and using criteria, you know, health equity-based criteria. So, 
you know, making sure we keep in mind that we're not just focusing on the large population centers, the urban centers, et cetera, right? Because um, I, I, I don't know that we get a good sense of what's, what's going on in communities, of, again, that word though, what's a community across the country. So rural, tribal, et cetera. So um, those are just my, you're right. It's, it, it is a big issue and clearly needs to be thought of, especially as we go beyond COVID. And we start talking about this as routine surveillance, you know, for other diseases, et cetera, because that really does, it could change um, some of the, um, the the aspects of it that you want to build into the system. I, let me just hold off there and maybe just ask, you know, Amy or anybody else who's really looked at that issue of how to define community surveillance. If you want to add any thoughts. I mean, I will just add that, yes, this is something we've been thinking about quite a bit, um, particularly with what is the appropriate coverage that we need to accomplish. Um, I think it's unreasonable to think that we'll get to 100% of the utilities that are, you know, true community serving utilities, not necessarily the lagoon style that um, Anna was pointing out. Um, and I don't think that is necessary to get the kind of public health data that we need. Um, but is it, you know, some um, percent coverage that we want to uh, be able to capture? Is it particularly prioritizing vulnerable communities? Um, or even is it a dynamic sampling frame? And so core surveillance has one level of coverage and frequency. And then if you want to do, for example, response, um, emergency response uh, surveillance, that changes frequency and coverage. That's another um, possibility. And there's advantages and disadvantages to um, both approaches. Um, as far as what constitutes a community, we've done that thinking as well. Um, I don't know if Zach wants to chime in on this. He and I were um, going through this a while ago because we got exactly this question. How many communities are covered by wastewater surveillance? And if you really want to highlight sort of the extreme of that, um, Lauren is actually a great example in Houston. They have 39 sampling sites to cover one city. Is that 39 communities? Is it one community? Is it something in between? Um, it's not an easy measure, which is why we've sort of directed towards sites as opposed to communities, but I, I think it's something we're going to have to um, put some definitions on as we go forward. Specifically. Sure. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate what you're saying about um, not being fully resolved amongst yourselves about how much scale we're taking this to to say that we're community wide. But I was actually sort of thinking about where you landed at the sort of the more granular end. What is the smallest unit of sampling and testing that you would consider to be a community? Because I think that's the most salient for thinking through the ethical issues. So again, Zach may have better numbers on this than I do, but I think our smallest facilities have in the range of 3,000 uh, people served by that facility, uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, that's about as small as you're going to get and have a serviceable plant that has the capacity to participate in wastewater surveillance. But we have had discussions about other types of community settings. For example, um, a large subdivision that has a shared septic tank. Um, if you sample upstream of the septic tank, it has a lot of the same um, capacity and characteristics of a wastewater treatment plant. Um, it's just being handled differently once it gets to the treatment part. Um, and so there may be a justification for looking at that as well. I know Washington State uh, is really interested in those kinds of applications. Um, and so I think those are all um, considerations. I will say it does link back to the ethics issue. So we do not release data publicly if the population that's captured is less than 3,000 people. Because at that point, you have an increased risk of being able to identify who the case is that's contributing to that sample. Uh, and so we just, uh, that is the, the boundary that we have on public data release, um, but certainly for internal use, we don't have. Um, we, we will um, look at samples uh, from as small a communities as it is feasible to look at. One more, sorry. <laughs> One more follow-up question on that. Um, in the statement of task in the paragraph below the bullets, it says, 
um, community wastewater-based disease surveillance implies sampling at wastewater treatment plants and does not include local surveillance at neighborhoods or institutional scales. I, I know early on we talked about institutions, but I wonder if your thinking has evolved since then so that you're more open to the neighborhood or you really want the committee to think about wastewater treatment plant sampling and then at different scales of those wastewater treatment plants. So I think our, our thinking has evolved a bit, um, but it's really about the larger plants um, for that question. So some of our very large systems like LA County is a great example. They serve, I believe, 5 million people all total. Um, and you're not going to get a very sensitive assay if you're testing just at the wastewater treatment plant. So there it makes sense to sample within the collection system so that you sort of break that big 5 million person uh, population up into smaller, um, maybe only 1 million person uh, groups. So there, sub-sewer shed sampling would be appropriate. What we sometimes hear people talking about is essentially tracking the sample and the signal through the wastewater treatment system up to wherever the source is. That is not... Um, a use of wastewater surveillance data that we want to support right now. And so that kind of sub sewer shed sampling where you're trying to isolate hotspot communities and things like that, um, we think that's really beyond um, what news wants to pursue. And so I would not consider that part of the scope of work. But if it's about improving the sensitivity of the surveillance approach in these very large systems, I think that is within the scope here. Does that uh, clarify for you, Stephanie? Yes, and very the, helpful. And the group. All right, Scott. Yeah, so I have um, two questions. So, so there was a comment Vince made about uh, variability in terms of one of the challenges you're facing. Um, in some modeling that we've done, one of the biggest sources of variability is still the shedding. And most of our shedding data thus far is, like uh, was mentioned earlier, is from the beginning of the pandemic on a very different variant than is currently circulating. Is there any... Um, efforts that you're aware of or that you're supporting that are going to characterize uh, shedding patterns for different variants and how this might impact how we do data interpretation? Yes, um, totally agree uh, with uh, Nathan's comment earlier that we don't have enough data on this. Scott, your comment now that we're missing it. Um, we are pursuing that data as much as we can. So we know there's a few NIH funded clinical trials that have a, a sort of side study where they're collecting uh, stool samples and doing quantitative testing there. So there's limited data that will be coming out of those. Um, we are also going to be funding a study to get additional data uh, on fecal shedding over time. So longitudinal data of all types of severities um, and hopefully we'll be able to get enough um, participants to be able to look at vaccination status and variants. Um, of course, the ability to do any of those analyses will depend on the state of the pandemic, what variants are circulating, people's willingness to participate. So we'll have to see what ultimately the um, participant group is in this study, but we are hopeful that we will be able to get more data in um, and looking at, you know, hopefully in the range of 50 to 90 participants, as opposed to the early studies, which were, you know, eight. That's excellent. That's great to hear. I, I had one other question regarding the use cases. So the other piece as far as the expansion of the panel beyond SARS, um, the use cases for different targets may be considerably different. And does that have any impact on uh, the design of the approach that news is going to use? Yeah, I think that's what we're wrestling with here um, because certainly um, I think the easiest place to think about that is sampling frequency for COVID. The more frequently you can sample, the better off you are and the more useful your data is. So twice a week is really the minimum to get uh, really useful data for action. If you're testing something like antibiotic resistance twice a week, you're wasting a lot of your effort <laughs> and time. Um, that is not a useful sampling frequency. So how do we... Um, come to a sampling frame and testing workflow um, that is most efficient 
while also protecting all of the public health action that we want to get out of this data. Um, and that's something that we're gonna be thinking about in great depth this year as we move towards that multi-pathogen uh, system. And really it's a trade-off between efficiency, right? Spending money where it is most useful um, and time, uh, you know, personnel resources as well, but also being mindful that any kind of dynamic testing system where you're changing sampling frequency, testing type, all of that, it has a, um, for lack of a better way to put it, a mental burden, right? And you introduce more, more um, potential points for error um, as things uh, get more complex. So we're trying to figure out where the sweet spot is for that. Um, and, you know, would love to hear the, the committee's thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I'm going to jump down to Chuck here in a second, but I, I'd just also point out that in just looking at different pathogens, it would not only be temporal, but obviously spatial. If you're looking for drug resistant C. oris, I would not look in rural Montana. Um, I would, there are certain places I would definitely um, put that in. I'm sure that's a consideration. Chuck, I'm going to jump down to you because you were, you, you were responding to something earlier. And then I'll yeah, come Yeah, I mean, a Amy, I think your, your response on the, community question to my mind sort of muddies things up i mean i i understand sampling at a treatment plant which i take to be the head headworks of the treatment plant typically um but the moment you know you throw in la as as your exemplar of wanting to go upstream i you know i think the issue is not population size it's heterogeneity and, um, you know, I think it's easier to tackle the question at the headworks of the plant. The moment you want to start to look at heterogeneity um, in whatever scale population you have a heterogeneous population in, you get into the question of, you know, where is the heterogeneity? How much is the heterogeneity? And to what degree is the variability temporal versus spatial, which opens up you know, a lot more uh, site-specific questions to consider. So, you know, I think the charge as as written, with my understanding to be the head works, is well understood. I I hate to see, without a lot more detailed deliberation, expansion into the collection system. Yeah, I, I mean, that wasn't really a question. It was more of a comment, but I will respond. I think you are correct there. And certainly being able to go out into the sewer system, the collection system and do samples and understand what they tell you really requires a very good and accurate hydraulic map. So you know what is actually flowing through those pipes and how much, and a lot of our systems don't have that, unfortunately. Um, and so you're right, in those cases, it does just introduce more variability. And the other piece to keep in mind um, as we think about subdividing systems is that we are not in a lockdown anymore, which is where we were when we first started doing wastewater surveillance. And you really only worried about where people lived. Um, now we have to worry about people moving between the different sampling zones. And so the smaller your um, sampling areas become, the more of that sort of transient, you know, people going from home to work to school, um, all of those places will impact the numbers that you see um, and your sort of consistency over time. So Chuck, I, I totally agree and, and take that um, take that in the, in the spirit with which it was offered. Um, and I think that's something that we really need to think about. Again, really only see this as an issue in those very largest systems. Um, where you know the the flow through the plant is just so massive um, that we might lose some sensitivity. Okay, we've got about four questions. We have eleven minutes because we have a public comment that that we need to respect that individual's time. So, quick questions and and brilliant short answers would be <laughs> would be awesome, Rekha. All right, I'll be super quick. So I'm kind of uh, developing on uh, 
uh, Amy's answer about, um, you know, uh, and your question to like how to figure out how many sites are important and where those sites should be. So as an uh, example from, a, you know, a jurisdiction, I would like to share our experience, how we designed real quick, like in three sentences. Uh, so we had a criteria, like we uh, advertised our um, you know, program uh, on various platforms and you reached out to utilities as much as possible and then first primary criteria was just to enroll utilities who were uh, having capability to sample and uh, uh, they had interest uh, in sampling and second thing was like we really wanted equitable representation from the state so we didn't want all the sites clustered in one uh, part of the state like our Hampton Road Sanitation District partners were uh, pioneers in this wastewater surveillance and we had their um, data from starting they were sharing every uh, all the uh, samples data and samples so we could have enrolled them and just you know make our total number to 25 we thought like let's go for 25 and uh, it, there was hesitancy in initially like having all the uh, you know sites which we were really interested in enrolling, especially from Central Virginia. We don't have many sites. Um, we have just uh, one site and I really need to convince them to come on board. And other than that, um, we have lots of sites from Northern Virginia. So Southwest Virginia is more um, low healthcare setting site. So we really needed to go out and about there to enroll some sites from there. And uh, now we are in our phase two, we are planning to enroll more sites from there. So uh, sort of, you know, uh, it's difficult to uh, figure out like how much is enough, but maybe something like that can help. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Ami, I think you're next. Hey, thanks so much. I wanted to follow up on John's point about trying to understand the dynamics of shedding for any disease and especially in the case of COVID-19 evolving variants. Um, our group recently published a manuscript that described the shedding dynamics uh, in feces of the original SARS-CoV-2 variant of about 100 or so individuals over the course of many, many months. Um, but the amount of work that went into actually collecting those samples and analyzing those data was quite substantial. I would love to see similar types of data, for example, in the context of Omicron and BA2. Uh, but the question is really whose responsibility is that? And in this report is, is this topic of, you know, the, the complementary data that we would need from individuals, um, part of what you'd like to like us to comment on. It's definitely within the scope of the report. So it shouldn't be a focus, but where there are big data gaps that are needed to really push forward the science of wastewater surveillance, I think those need to be flagged. Um, and clearly, the more data we can get on fecal shedding and the impact of variants, and this is going to be needed for all of those other pathogens, too. Um, highlighting that will be important. Thank you. Marissa. So I had a quick question about sort of your thinking around. So you mentioned, you know, as part of the scope of the charge, sort of thinking about uh, what other pathogens you know, the system could be used for. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about from, about sort of which pathogen, like what you, I saw, you know, in the in the, the three buckets and that kind of thing. How do you feel of that emerging pathogens fit into this and, and sort of where do you think that sits? So personally, I'm really excited about the application of wastewater surveillance for emerging pathogens, because that's really where we see this impact of um, the skew in clinical surveillance the strongest because we first become aware of them in the most severe cases in the hospital. And very often it's years before we really understand community levels. And so wastewater surveillance gives us a um, low barrier to entry way to ask um, that community level question. And so I think that it has a lot of potential for that. Um, and would really like to see, you know, that uh, concept sort of really explored and fleshed out um, and hear the, the committee's uh, thinking on that and sort of what would be the criteria of an emerging infection that you would want to see before you uh, think that it is a, a good target for wastewater surveillance. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Amy. Um, I have a question. Of, I think at some point you talked about how um, you foresee this transitioning to primarily uh, public health labs 
and with a specific method. You know, right now it's a big mix of academic, private, public health, lots of methods. You know how academics, we love our methods and we don't want to give them up, right? So I'm wondering, as we think about this report, are we envisioning this future you kind of, you, you, you said where it is at the public health labs, it is a very specific method, or is there space to kind of think about a hybrid system in, be, in between, not necessarily what we have now, but that still has these other these other types of labs and these other types of methods. Kind of where can where can we explore in that space? There's definitely room for exploring that hybrid space. Um, I think right now there's not much question that we are too dependent on academic partners. They we are hearing that from the academics that they want to be able to free up their staff to do research and not be bound to this turnaround time. However, we have also heard from some of our state partners that they have great relationships with their academic partners. They don't want to change what they're doing. This relationship is working for them right now. Um, and so we need to figure out how we're going to address that. Is it a transition period where it's just going to be a longer time before we get everyone to public health labs? Or is there some stable relationship and sort of ratio between these academic public health lab partnerships and the ones that are straight public health lab um, implementation. So I, I think that is definitely fertile ground um, for exploration. All right, are there any other questions? Yeah, Guy, I have a quick one and I'm sorry to jump in at the end of the line, but I just no, wanna ask, yeah, I just wanna, um, Amy, you mentioned data gaps. Um, how much should we uh, maybe comment on or explore what research needs to be done, which is a little different than data or method validation? You know, I, I see that as maybe two separate things. And I know we've talked about how, you know, research covers that spectrum, but can you maybe just talk a little bit about delineating those two things and maybe how we might handle that in the report? Yeah, so my thoughts on that is, I would really encourage you to focus on the research gaps that are critical for moving forward the application of wastewater surveillance. So there's lots of ways that you can look into how wastewater surveillance can support other research needs, and there's definitely room for that in the future. Um, but for this report, we really want to focus on the application for public health. And so what are the gaps that we need to address that right now, specifically for those infectious targets? Um, and how will that inform the way we are implementing um, and coordinating the system? Is that helpful? That might've been a little too spot on and, and um, snappy. <laughs> that could probably use more description. Yeah, no, I think the, app, I think the, you know, the application kind of bin is a good way to put it. Okay. Anything you need for application, yeah. Okay. All right, and our last question, Michelle. Could you clarify whether you see the phase two report as including any of the ethical, legal, or social issues that we've been talking about today, or really focusing and that focusing on but expanding on the technical issues? I think it has to, um, particularly because that's where uh, you will start thinking about things like. Um, future pandemic potential, right? So detecting that unknown pathogen that we don't know about yet and, and being able to have the, the system that we all want um, to detect the next pandemic. And whenever we start talking about that, ethics have to go along with that. And so I think um, it, it's gonna have to be in the phase two report. All right, thank you. Um, we do have one, one public comment, um, Brian Swalla. I'd just like to call on you, Brian. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you for the opportunity to provide a comment today. Uh, just a tiny bit of background, and then I'll make our uh, summarize my comment. I'm a microbiologist and molecular biologist with IDEX Laboratories in Westbrook, Maine. I've been involved with SARS-CoV-2 testing from the beginning of the pandemic. When IDEX rapidly developed and validated two products and testing protocols for detection of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. I and my colleagues here at IDEX have had the opportunity to collaborate with a broad variety of organizations and many individuals to share information and assist with the implementation of testing methods. Uh, we've submitted a detailed written comment, uh, but I'd like to just 
off of the key points here. To, avoid, to achieve a robust and integrated wastewater-based infectious disease surveillance program, three foundational elements to consider could include agreement on what type of data should be collected, the quality of the data, the objectives for that quality, and lastly, how and to whom the resulting information will be communicated and acted upon. But as we've heard today, the, the scientific community, community is keenly aware that health-related actions must be based on reliable and high-quality analytical test data. Testing methods for any type of infectious disease surveillance must be performed by laboratories with demonstrated competency, which is routinely accomplished for other federal programs through a laboratory accreditation process. Typically, data quality objectives should be established prior to program implementation. However, this was not necessarily an option during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Many different testing methods for SARS-CoV-2 were developed, as we've heard, by a wide variety of organizations universities, public research organizations, private laboratories, and industry all converged and collaborated in developing test methods. And indeed, it was one of the most collaborative scientific endeavors in many of our lifetimes. Now that we as a public health community are set to move towards long-term monitoring, it is critical that data quality objectives and data uses are identified and clearly communicated. Uh, as a manufacturer, we make myriad design choices when creating analytical tests and having a clear understanding of data use and data quality objectives is imperative to ensure that those decisions are made well and with the best interest of public health in mind. Thank you and happy to entertain any questions if that's appropriate. Super, thank you, Brian, for those comments. Um, are there any questions to Brian? I think that was quite clear and congruent with a lot of what we've heard today, Brian. So, so thank you and thank you for that perspective. Great, um, thank you. If there are no other questions, um, I want to thank all of our speakers and, and Brian, I include you in there. I want to thank you as well. And to everyone else who's joined the meeting today, um, information on uh, future meetings will be posted on the study website. Um, and you can also sign up on the committee website to be added to the mailing list. So thank you and enjoy um, what's left of your day, depending on your time zone. So take care. <laughs>